Good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online in association with ASSI, Association of Spine Surgeons of India, Master Series webinar to introduce today's topic and the speakers. I hand over to our moderator, Dr. Gautam Zaveri. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fifth in the series of ASSI Master Series webinars. And uh, today, we are going to have a master series webinar. Can you enable screen sharing, Neeraj? Enabled for you, your co-host. Okay, but I'm it's not... Enabled. It's enabled for everyone. Yeah, but I am not able to share my presentation. No, you are co-host. You should be. Yes, everybody can share. Share screen. Okay, I got it now. All right. So sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Hi. good afternoon. Uh, so uh, we welcome to this fifth in the series of ASSI Master Series webinars. The constant uh, issues which creeps up when there is a problem of deformity is how to manage these spinal deformities, how to assess them how to plan the management and adolescent idiopathic scoliosis being one of the most common and simplest deformities to uh, start with. We are going to have this webinar on adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, how to evaluate them and plan these deformities. Today, we have got Dr. Abhay Nene from the Leelawati and Breach Candy Hospital in Bombay, uh, the a former president of AO Spine India, and a very eloquent speaker and teacher who is going to lead the interactive case discussion. Along with that, we have a host of scoliosis experts from across the country. They are going to deal with the basics of scoliosis, what all residents, fellows, and consultants in practice would like to know. We have Dr. Rohit Amritanand from the Christian Medical College, Vellore, who is going to speak about the, how to do the history and examination of these patients. Dr. Arjun Dhavle from the Reliance Foundation Hospital in Mumbai, who's talking about the radiological evaluation of these patients. Bhau Garg from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Dr. Soumya Jeet Basu from the Kotari Hospital and the Park Clinic in Kolkata. We have Dr. Amit Jhala from the Chirayu Hospital in Ahmedabad and Dr. Rajesh Parasnis from the Pearl and Oyster Hospital in Pune. As I said, all recognized experts. So I'm sure you are in for a treat today. Don't miss a word of what they say. I would like to give you some background. The ASSI or the Association of Spinal Surgeons has a website and we would love for you to follow us at that website and all the information regarding ASSI activities, ASSI membership, ASSI conferences are available at this website. Besides that, ASSI has a Facebook page, a Twitter handle, and a YouTube channel, all of which are active and functional. And we would encourage you to follow us on these uh, social media platforms for further information about ASSI activities. Some of the ASSI webinars that are available on YouTube channel include the master series webinars on odontoid fractures, craniovertebral junctional problems, cervical myelopathy, and com complications in cervical surgery. And pro series webinars on lumbar disc herniation, lumbar disc herniation part two, lumbar canal stenosis, lumbar spondylolisthesis, where the Indian Orthopedic Association is our partner. ASSI also has a video journal. Here, leading spine surgeons from across the country come up with articles that they themselves have loved and they felt that they have that has changed their practice. We have the, so far launched three editions of the ASSI video journal, and I'm sure that you will love the, the knowledge that comes out of this if you follow us. And the, these journals are also available on our YouTube channel. ASSI has launched eight monographs. Each monograph is a book by itself 
which deals with all aspects of that particular topic. Some of the monographs that are being launched are lumbar disc herniation, lumbar canal stenosis, spinal tuberculosis, ankylosing spondylitis, early onset scoliosis, cervical craniovertebral junction anomalies, complications in spine surgery, and osteoporosis and the spine. All these are available either individually or as yet on Amazon as well as through our medical publishers, the TM Medical Publishers. The ASSI textbook on spinal infections and trauma edited by none other than the famous Dr. S. Rajasekharan is available through the editors, through Amazon and through our publishers, the JP Publishers. The Indian Spine Journal is the official publication of the ASSI. It's a quarterly journal, which is edited by none other than the former editor of the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, Dr. Anil Jain. And it has a host of topics, which will be very interesting for every person interested in spinal problems. We also encourage you to send your articles for publication to these spinal journals, and we would be very happy to respond to them. The ASSI outreach program. If you want ASSI to hold a spine program in your town, write to us and we will try to work it out. In the last two years, we have had about eight programs in various secondary and tertiary care cent uh, centers across the country. With these programs are typically held as a one day symposium or a symposium combined with live surgery. And we can work this out in association with the local orthopedic or spine body. If you have any queries regarding that, please write to our secretary, Dr. Ajoy Shetty at ajoyshetty at gmail.com. Recently, ASSI has launched an e-learning program, which is an online spine educated education program, which has created, been curated and uh, edited by masters of spine surgery from across the world. The ASICON, which is our annual conferences of 2021, will be held from January 29 to 31. And our president, Dr. Chabra, will be the organizing chairman. We would be glad to have all of you and we would welcome you and actually encourage you to register for this conference and make the maximum use out of it. We will be giving you more information in subsequent webinars as more information develops. During this webinar, if you are unable to, for some, your questions can be put to us through the YouTube channel chat box and we will put it to our panelists. However, if you are unable for to raise your doubts or queries by that, then you can WhatsApp your queries to me, Dr. Gautam Zaveri, Joint Secretary of ASSI at my mobile number 9820504351 or to my email address gautamzaveri1969 at gmail.com. So without much ado, let me stop sharing the screen and now invite Dr. Abhay Nene to take over the session and take it through to the very end. I'm sure you're all in for a treat. Don't miss even a second of this. Thank you. Abhay, please take Absolutely, over. Absolutely, Gautam. In fact, I pitched in to become a moderator here because the six big fish that are going to be uh, on your screens today for the next two hours are the biggest six fish in scoliosis surgery in our country. And uh, we, we are trying to match up with the efforts of the ASSI done so far. And you can see the ASSI uh, is doing efforts or the, their current standing in the, in the academic world is shoulder to shoulder with any SRS or any NAS. And we must thank our uh, secretary, Ajay Shetty, our co-secretary, Dr. Gautam Javari, and of course, our president, Dr. Chabra, and our incoming presidents to, uh, uh, to get us here. So AIS is the next big thing. And uh, all of us who've been through learnings of uh, lumbar pedicle screws, thoracic pedal screws, cervical instrumentations, anterior surgery are now moving to uh, learn AIS because unfortunately not taught as much in our post-graduation program. And uh, these cases which, uh, you know, we were not busy with before because we were busy treating, uh, um, you know, life-saving and limb-saving problems are, are now, uh, you know, cosmetic lifestyle problems that are coming to the fore. And uh, it's something that you can learn uh, after your many years into practice rather than uh, learning at the helm. So um, uh, this, this program today, as you can see, is, uh, is self-evolving. Um, you start from the clinical, um, uh, you know, clinical profiling of patients and you end with surgical tips with uh, every little step tailor-made for the audience. Um, uh, we, uh, like I said, the faculty here is uh, one that's going to only give us pearls of wisdom. So may I call upon 
you know the the muscle man of CMC, and that's Dr. Rohit Amritanan, who is over the years. made his name as a uh, as a very eloquent speaker a very good spine surgeon a person with a great scientific background who's been doing a lot of uh, research and publication also and most importantly he's very active in uh, uh, pediatric deformity surgery rohit is going to talk to us about clinical assessment from the surgical standpoint and hence um, it will be interesting to know what how a surgeon will want to look at a scoliosis patient and how he looks at a rib hump compared to the mother of the patient and uh, we are all welcome to stop him in the middle of the game and ask him questions uh, while while he discusses uh, case uh, case by case over to you rohit uh thank you abhay let me just share my screen please go ahead rohit yeah i'm just trying to get that done yes all right um so good afternoon and uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing this event and for the introduction uh, abhay and um, good afternoon to all my uh, colleague uh, panelists too so um uh, over the past 15 years that i've been uh, sort of involved with spine surgery i I've, i've discovered that you come full circle you know you start off as a as a as a post grad learning about uh, clinical evaluation and then after that you get so busy and 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 involved with uh, putting in a safe pedicle screw and learning about uh, deformity correction that you uh, your your focus or, or the sinosure of your attention moves from basic clinical evaluation uh, and planning uh, into more the surgical steps and there's no doubt that uh, that the surgical steps are critical and very important but i think after these uh, few years of experience with this uh, with this problem uh, i think we all realize that uh you know sort of the warm up the warm up is as is just about as important as the main game so having said that uh today i'm going to not be focusing on some sort of a textbook approach or a you know say a clinical das approach uh, chapter 1 of clinical evaluation but i'm going to try and keep this as to what a surgeon an operating surgeon or an experienced surgeon or even a young surgeon uh, should know when uh, a patient with ais along with their family members walks in to your clinic so um, the learning objectives of this uh, of this uh, of this talk really is to understand that ais is really a diagnosis of exclusion so then you as a surgeon you are obliged to go through the whole history of of trying to uh, rule out congenital syndromic as well as uh, neuromuscular problems uh, so your history has to be fairly detailed and and the gold only lies at the end of the digging uh so you will only say that it's an ais or any is once you have ruled out all the other uh, issues that can uh, contribute to deformity your clinical examination also has to be tailored for that so whether you like it or not this talk is going to have to go through uh, congenital neuromuscular and syndromic uh, events in order to say that this is now an is and depending upon the age of onset you would say ais so uh the So, if you look at the history, the real goals of 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 you know taking a good history is to identify the organic curves, or when there is an organic uh, underlying pathology, you need to identify or rule out or rule in those kind of curves, and all the other curves are then referred to as the non-idiopathic curves. The other thing is to also estimate curve progression, to uh, decide about the impact or to quantify the impact of the deformity uh, in terms of function, uh, prosthesis, and the 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 impact it has on the child psychology and the parent psychology and also to gauge separately the uh, patients and the parents expectations and then of course to document demographics that helps you follow up and uh, you know those kind of things and do your research of course so at the end of your at the end of your history i think you should have a clear understanding as to first of all are these two curves different could there be a different underlying uh, etiology um and had this been a question answer sh- session along with uh, you the delegates i would have surely asked whether you all have an understanding as to which one is what and which one is is an ais and which is not but at the end of this talk i hope you all will will be able to figure that out now as i had mentioned it's really important to start the history with documenting who the informants are now obviously in is in just plain and simple idiopathic scoli if it's an infant or a juvenile um you are not likely to spend too much of time talking to the patient itself but in an ais patient i think you are obliged to start the discussion start the history taking with the patient uh, him or herself uh, then of course you will back that uh, information up from the parent and then try and get the parent's perspective also 
if you open your textbook of uh, edited by uh, by Keith Bridwell, you will see that there is a there is a fair amount of uh, of uh, of, uh, of of discrepancy between what parents want and what the patients want, or the parents' concerns and the patients' concerns. And I've listed them there. I think if you open uh, Bridwell, you will find that this this table is there, and you should read it through actually quite carefully. Uh, that will help you decide what kind of treatment strategy you're going to be adopting. Are you going to, in fact, be operating that child at all? Because we've had patients who've come in with fairly grotesque deformities, but the child is, is dead against the surgery for whatever reason, and the parents are very keen upon it. So make sure that you pick uh, the right patient. The demographics, of course, you all are familiar with. For us, it's mainly because we are deep down in the south, away from metropolitan cities that, for us, uh, you know, sort of keeping in touch and following up these patients can sometimes be a challenge. And if there is a post-op complication, what forbid then, you know, having to keep an eye on them can sometimes be a challenge, especially if they're coming in from the subcontinent region. So all that once is documented, uh, then you move on to the, to the meat of the history itself. Uh, you will, of course, go through uh, the marital history of the parents. Uh, in, in, you, know, you know that in consang consanguineous marriages, there's a higher chance of congenital problems. There's this article here that talks about uh, AIS being prevalent in a particular family from Brazil. You will go through the antenatal history. Uh, the APCA score is something that you should try to sort of retrospectively document the milestones, the immunization, and then try and figure out when the child had uh, their second growth spurt in terms of uh, height, the peak height velocity, as well as uh, menarchal and voice changes. As I had mentioned, try to analyze what is the real problem? What's the complaint? Is it pain? Is it functional limitations like you'll have in maybe a neuromuscular patient, or is it just the plain deformity, which we all keep talking about is a cosmetic problem, but I think it's way more than just a plain cosmetic problem. Try to do an, uh, a, a historical analysis of the motor sensory and bladder or bowel involvement, particularly in patients with non-idiopathic problems. Who noticed the deformity first? Was it the child? Was it a friend? Was it peers? Was it the parent? And was it the father? I think it's important to document that. When was it? Obviously, depending upon uh, the SRS classification of, uh, of juvenile and, and, uh, and, uh, ad uh, and ad adolescent uh, idiopathic scoli. Uh, try to document the speed of progress. Has it been a short progression? And, or has there been any treatment uh, which has been deployed so far? Um, asking about where the site, before you actually strip the patient, uh, uh, asking about the site of the deformity is important. Upper thoracic or, or lower lumbar right curve, left curve, I think all these things give you a lot of insight into what you may expect. Do not neglect the front. Do not neglect other deformities. So I'm talking about precordial deformities that the child may have because you'll be so focused on the back that you will forget that there is a front that can also rotate uh, and lead on to uh, issues here. Yet here I'm not pointing out the cafe early patch. I'm really pointing out the precordial uh, deformity the child was very concerned about. The other thing that you'll often hear patients complaining about, and you're trying to sift out, are they worried about the cosmetic deformity or is it the back pain that's really troubling them? And if it is the pain, how bad is it? So if you look at literature, you'll find that back pain in scoli patients is comparable. It's comparable to the general population, but frequent daily back pain may be slightly higher. And there is a large uh, series over here reported where they have shown that 23% uh, of these patients will have back pain and out of those, uh, only 9% will have some underlying pathology. I thought I'll share this little anecdotal uh, report uh, that we had picked up. This child had come to us uh, with a small curve in the upper thoracic spine, and we got imaging done, and it turned out to be uh, uh, this uh, uh, rib exostosis, which was causing uh, the curve. Um, also look at functional limitations in terms of involvement with games, climbing of stairs, are their school bags bothering them? Do they fatigue easily? If they fatigue easily, you'll obviously have to begin to think of a cardiopulmonary issue which goes along with the deformity. Do not forget other, uh, other anomalies, skin lesions, uh, myelopathic features, tightness in legs, unsteadiness in gait, et cetera. All this obviously is done to rule out organic problems and then labeling it as idiopathic. So in summary, the history, the main thing, I've mentioned them here and, uh, I, and I had started uh, the slides with that, this is just to reinforce what we've talked about. Moving on quickly to the clinical examination, you start with the general physical. And I think you need to spend a little bit of time before you get involved with the curves and then going on to the neurologic assessment. 
So in the general physical, remember to assess the heights, assess a serial assessment of the height would be actually preferable to determine when the peak height velocity uh, was actually attained. You can do this sitting, standing to assess uh, trunk, uh, trunkal height growth or, or the lower limb growth. Uh, look at the head, not for the centering, for the balance, but mainly because of any dysmorphic uh, features that you might find. Open the mouth, check the arm span, assess joint laxity for Ehlers Danlos. Auscultate the heart if you can, at least know where, you know, where, whether you have uh, a murmur which you might pick up and assess the respiratory status and make the patient walk. These obviously will tell you this patient has a neuro neurofibromatosis. Uh, you can tell with all the stigma there uh, as soon as you do a general physical examination. Document the maturity by the Tanner staging. So that's the pubic hair, the female breast size, and the male external genitalia. When you move on to the regional examination, please make sure that you uh, can strip the child to whatever socially acceptable extent you have, but you do need to have a three-dimensional uh, view of the child. It's no point just trying to look at the back because then you will miss, you will definitely miss a lot of information. The first thing that you will do is assess trunkal balance. Make sure that the head, or at least document that the head is centered over the gluteal cleft, or if there is a trunkal asymmetry, anything more than about two or three centimeters, uh, 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 sort of is a red flag that there is something uh, going on more than just an idiopathic scoliosis. Once you have documented that, then move forward in a methodical fashion. You know, where's the, the head center? Look at the shoulder asymmetry. Look at the rib hump. Look at the, uh, the, the, uh, the subcostal impingement. Turn the patient around, uh, look for any facial asymmetry, and then, of course, uh, assess the breast uh, asymmetry also and document that. This we'll last. 10 uh, minutes down, uh, we'll still give you a couple of minutes. Sure, I'm almost done here. The last one is, of course, looking at, uh, the, at the, the, the arm trunk distance. Uh, this is a handy way of doing it, just palpating and, and, and plotting out the, 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 the dots in the spinous process. You, when you look at the deformity, you should try and make a extrapolate as to what you may find in radiographs. Don't forget a sagittal assessment, because here you can see there's thoracic hyperlordosis. This is how you assess for flexibility. This can be lying, done lying in a forward position for the Adams test or else in a prone, in, in a prone position. Assess and look for other kind of stigma uh, for underlying uh, intraspinal anomalies. The superficial abdominal reflex is probably the single most important neurologic assessment that you must do, and Min Mehta's paper tells you about that. Uh, don't forget the rest of the musculoskeletal system. So the last couple of slides, uh, if you just look at this, would you be able to guess as to what the underlying uh, uh, pathology may be? What about this one? And what about this one? So all these, if you have done a proper clinical examination, you would be able to make a good clinical diagnosis on these without having to do any further imaging. So the take home message, look at the curves by all means, but look beyond them, estimate curve progression, assess the impact of the deformity on these various outcomes, do a full and proper clinical examination. And, and I would suggest to you that do the curve examination last, look at everything else before that. Thank you. Very succinct, Rohit. That was perfect. Perfectly on the ball and exactly what the doctor ordered. So uh, may, uh, may I open this uh, for a few questions from the faculty who are in-house? And of course, we'll take questions from the, um, from the channel, which is, play, which is running, relaying this show. Rohit, may I cast the first stone? How, what do you, do you make a big deal of pelvic asymmetry or leg, limb length discrepancy in AI? So sometimes you find that the dimple of Venus is asymmetric. Uh, um, you know, how, how much importance do you give that? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, so in my muscular schedule sl slide, I had uh, put up a, a sort of a bullet saying that you need to assess uh, uh, the limb length discrepancy. Absolutely. Uh, that's critical, not just the Venus dimple, but even the AI, ASIS from the front. Uh, in fact, that's a bony point. So, you know, you can actually mark those out and assess. And then after that, use, uh, use sort of foot blocks to try and, to try and utilize the limb length discrepancy. But uh, Abhay, as you pointed out, that is an absolutely essential uh, thing to get done, mainly to also rule out neuromuscular causes of, uh, of, uh, of the deformity. Right. So, uh, my question was slightly different. In case you find a little bit of that, how does it skew your thinking when you're talking of an AIS kid? Well, I think less than two centimeters, you know, 1.5 to two centimeters, you may not, uh, you may not, uh, you know, sort of think too much about it, but then you obviously do have, you have that at the back of your head. And then when you do your imaging, you'll probably uh, look a little closer at, at, uh, at any other anomalies or else uh, the, the neuromuscular causes of, uh, of the deformity. Rajesh, you had a question and Gautam. Yes. Yeah, I had a question for not my, this is Dr. Apurva Acharya from Ahmedabad asking a question. 
and he asked that I have a patient who has a right-sided thoracic curve, but the ideally in these cases shoulder should be higher on the right side. But this patient has a shoulder which is balanced, or maybe the left shoulder is slightly higher. What should I conclude, and how does this reflect on the further treatment? Can I can I take that? Yes, for you. Yeah. So um, to answer that, look, you've done a clinical examination and you found that, but have you done a radiograph to assess the T1 tilt? You know, because it might, you know, the, like the trapezial fold may look as if it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's equal. But I think it is critical to go and to go ahead and get measure the T1 tilt, not just the, 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 the radiographic shoulder height. So the clinical shoulder height is less accurate than the radiographic shoulder height, which I think is less accurate than the T1 tilt. So I would first, I mean, I would first get the radiograph and then after that worry about it. The second step to that is what uh, I think Dr. Menon has described as a discordant, uh, as a discordant, uh, uh, so, so a shoulder asymmetry where you have a proximal thoracic, so you have a main thoracic curve and then a small proximal thoracic curve, which then offsets uh, what you would expect amongst the shoulder height things, the, the so-called discordancy. But Rohit, what you briefly alluded to was the trapezius fullness versus the shoulder height. Can you uh, tell us a bit more about that? Like, does the trapezius fullness skew our uh, estimation of the real shoulder height? Yeah, so there's a bit of a parallax there. So you're looking at the whole thing. I mean, you may imagine that the trapezius is a little higher on one side. But I think to nail that answer, you finally do have to get your x-ray and not just me measure the RSH or the, or, the, or the radiographic shoulder height. It is more also to do with, your, with the T1 tilt. So get all that done and then after that, begin to worry about discordance. Got it. That actually leads us very nicely into uh, the radiography map. Is there any other burning question? One more question from Dr. Pratik, again from Ahmedabad. Yes. Uh, Pratik asks uh, that what about, how does, is the pulmonary function affected in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis versus early onset scoliosis? Um, no, obviously not as much. There's, there's no question. But if you have, if you have a severe deformity, severe long-standing so which means after 10 years of age this patient has been having you know so then you'll call it an adolescent curve but sometimes the GISs will present uh, in the adolescent period and that child may have had it since the age of nine uh, and if it's a very severe deformity there's no doubt that you will have pulmonary function uh, uh, sort of affectation but I think the underlying physiology of it will be different for the EOS because there's hyperplasia and hypertrophy issues uh, and the physiology of it in uh, Adolescence is different. It's more so a the developmental uh, uh, part completely gets eliminated in the AIS. Yes, well, in yeah. EOS, there's a developmental uh, uh, pro problem with the body. Yeah, I think the correct terminology would be hyperplasia and the, hyper, and the hypertrophy. If there is a 60 degree AIS in a 13 year old girl, should she be evaluated for pulmonary function or is it not necessary? Uh, for, for a pulmonary function test, like a PFT, maybe, maybe not if she has no symptoms. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I think you'll ask them symptoms first if they're if they're up with their peers in a, in a in a in a running race, they climb upstairs to your clinic. They have no symptoms, and I don't see any reason why you should. Uh, Sixty degrees is is not a big curve at all, so uh, they should not have any symptoms. Yeah, it's, I tend to agree. Uh, Bhavuk and then Rajesh, and then we'll move on. Just last. I, I just want to add to the uh, to the Rohit's so this thing. Uh, there is a term called metabolic equivalence. So, uh, you know, if you want to do a PFT in a particular patient, so the concept of metabolic equivalent is there. So if the metabolic equivalent for a particular person is less than four, then they require, you know, all sort of PFT monitoring. So basically the thing is if they can walk four to six miles per hour speed and they can climb the stairs, uh, especially two flights of stairs, then they don't require PFT as such. So this is a useful thing, you know, by which you can predict uh, this thing. The what about a six-inch candle blow test, which uh, we used to yes. do? When we... And you can use the uh, the spirometer also, incentive spirometer. So you can uh, blow up as well as you can suck the air. And then you can see whether the balls, how many balls are. So if there is only if the two balls, they are going up, then you can be certain that this could be okay. The other thing is uh, most of the times, this is the restrictive uh, PFT defect, not the obstructive PFT defect in these individuals. So one has to be very careful in diagnosing this thing. The other thing I wanted to point out is the visual defects. So you, one has to be very careful, you know, when these are long standing, so their field of vision changes. So sometimes you have to ask the patient uh, that is there any effect on your vision on this thing. So if there is a vision, then they have to be very careful and an ophthalmological evaluation should be done. The other thing is you have to look very carefully on the skin creases, you know, when they are long standing and this thing, so they may get developed fungal infections and all those things, which usually people discover while on the, on the table when you are this thing. So one has to be very careful for these things. Uh, 
Great. Lovely yeah. poses. Rajesh, briefly. Yeah. So we yeah. can... Briefly, just few points I would like uh, Rohit's comment on about which I have burnt my fingers. First, patient who complains of uh, severe unexplained headache recurrently. Second is on examination while bending forward, there is a list. On standing, there is not so much, but bending forward. Third, unusual stiffness while doing on all movements. And fourth is the asymmetrical abdominal reflex. Just a quick comment from you. For me, uh, Rajesh? Yeah, just a comment from you. For is, there a, is, there, no, is, there a, is there a question in those statements? Because I, I agree with all that you said. These are all red flags, isn't it? That's yeah, what these are all yeah. red flags. Yeah. I, yeah. I, can't, so. I can't explain the list. I mean, I can't explain the list other than the fact that when you get the rib hump, then again, you know, your visual parallax uh, uh, kind of gets different. But your uh, uh, remark about the abdominal reflex, absolutely valid. And I think uh, every postgrad or fellow spine surgeon has to do that. Uh, without that, you're going to be in trouble. Lovely. So great discussion on the first topic. We move on to... Uh, the Ishan Kishan of the Mumbai Indians, and that's Dr. Arjun Dhavle. He carries the burden of taking scoliosis surgery into the next generation. He's a fantastic uh, ta talent uh, from Bombay and does a lot of good early onset scoliosis as well as uh, uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, amongst other spine surgeries. And he's going to take up a very, very important topic. What x-ray to do, how to do, when to do, when to do a CT, when to do a Milo, when to do an MRI. So it's all yours, Arjun. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Zaveri, uh, Dr. Ajay Shetty, and Dr. Nene for this opportunity. And thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I have a lot to learn yet, and I'll try to share with you whatever I've learned from my colleagues and uh, from my mentors. So basically, I'm going to talk about imaging for uh, scoliosis. And uh, basically, the three groups of patients. There's a group of patients which is going to require only observation. There's a group of patients which is going to go for bracing. And there's a group of patients going to require surgery. And we're going to talk about the imaging uh, you know, what imaging we need, when do we need to image and how do we image. So the first thing is you need to differentiate uh, uh, idiopathic scoliosis from a congenital scoliosis. Now, this is obviously not an idiopathic scoliosis because you can see the, uh, uh, the bar there, you know, and you can see the kyphosis on the lateral. So this is obviously not an idiopathic scoliosis. So this basically does not, you know, go into anything that we're talking about. Uh, it's a congenital scoliosis. You've got to do an MRI, do the workup, do the 2D echo, ultrasound, etc. So these are totally different ball games. So you got to pick it up on the X-ray. Uh, as has been alluded to earlier, the idiopathic scoliosis is a diagnosis of exclusion, and eventually it is a radiographic diagnosis after we have ruled out the other clinical problems. So uh, basically, when we evaluate, you know, there is always there is always going to be three curves in a scoliosis. Okay, a proximal thoracic, a main thoracic, and a, a lumbar curve. And the way we measure it is a Cobb angle, which is basically using the end vertebra. Now, it's important for us to understand uh, whether there is a progression of this curve with time and with, or is this curve maintaining and what's happening with the central sacral vertical line, you know. So this is exactly, uh, you know, how we measure the Cobb angle from end vertebra to end vertebra, which is the most tilted vertebra. Uh, one has to also look at the vertebral rotation, you know, which is uh, based on the pedicles. Uh, so how the pedicle is uh, appearing on the radiograph that tells us about how much rotation there is. And one needs to understand the terminology, you know, which is the neutral vertebra, which is uh, the, the least rotated vertebra, and the stable vertebra, which is the vertebra which is bisected by the uh, central sacral vertical line. One should not ignore the sagittal profile. So the sagittal uh, profile is uh, sort of very important to look at. So one can't forget about it. Usually in idiopathic scoliosis, there is a hypokyphosis. So it's usually not hyperkyphotic, but hypokyphotic. So there's a decreased kyphosis. So this is a, a child, you know, with scoliosis, and you can see the serial progression that's happening. Uh, 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 please do appreciate the increase in the Cobb angle and also see the decompensation that's happening, you know, in the uh, uh, coronal profile, uh, you know, over two years. And that's basically what happened. You know, you can see the child's Cobb angle increase, but you can also see that the child is decompensating off from the midline. Now, these scoliosis research guidelines uh, for treatment are fairly clear for a curve which is less than 20 degrees we monitor. Now, the majority of scoliosis actually falls into this group. Uh, all right. So any scoliosis is defined as any curve that's more than 10 degrees. Uh, any, uh, you know, curve between 20 to 40 can be treated with orth orthosis uh, based on documented progression. And of course, if there's skeletal immaturity and any curve which is above 50 degrees deserves surgery or is an indication for surgery. Now, how do we uh, look, look at progression? So there are two uh, sort of important grades. One is a reserve grade. So, which is based on the uh, iliac apophysis, you know, where basically if once the iliac apophysis appears, it's one, 
and then as it sort of goes uh, uh, towards the uh, posterior aspect, it's four, and when the entire thing is fused, it's five. Now it's important that your scoliosis film does include the eye crest, so uh, because that way you don't need any additional imaging, and on that one film you will be obviously able to assess also what the razor grade is. There is a Sanders maturity scale, which is based on the left-hand radiograph, uh, you know, which has been described in 2008. And uh, I've just alluded to it here. Uh, basically, it's very important from stage two to stage zero to stage four, uh, you know, because uh, after stage five and six, it's basically you are able to correlate on the riser. But uh, the early stages, especially when you want to brace a patient, this might be useful. And uh, this is basically based on the uh, uh, fusion of the uh, epiphysis or the phalanges uh, and the uh, in the hand, basically. So you know, based on their appearance and their fusion. Okay, and it's from uh, stage zero to the eight. Now this has been evaluated. You know, basically the uh, correlation of the racer with the Sanders maturity scale, and uh, they found it to be especially useful uh, for children. You know, uh, when we want to predict uh, which patients are going to benefit from bracing. All right, and uh, the racer basically is a proprietor in the early stages, especially. So I'm going to now categorize this talk into three areas. So the one group is the observation and bracing group. Okay. So what X-ray do we require to do? We need to do a PA or AP spine erect. We need to do a lateral spine erect and at a frequency of six months. Um, I will reiterate that we do not need to do bending films for these patients. Okay. So uh, it's just a, a PA or AP spine erect and a lateral spine, which is done to be done erect. We don't usually do supine films in scoliosis for assessment because the curve obviously does increase when you stand. So, for example, this is a child, uh, you know, adolescent girl. Uh, she came in with uh, these two curves, all right? And uh, she was braced, okay? And you can see the correction in the bracing. And uh, it's very important that when you are putting a brace on, you check the X-ray with the brace on to see that the curb angle is reducing by 50% or more. Because an effective brace uh, can be called effective only if the curb angle is reduced by 50%. So this is what happened to the child with, you know, over two, three years. But uh, basically, we were able to fairly arrest a uh, curve with just with the brace. And this is another example, you know, just showing you the correction in the brace. So if the brace does not show this correction, then you need to can, kind of get it modified again. Uh, this is the CAD cam, you know, the imaging which can be done for the brace uh, sort of uh, designing. So I've just tried, tried to include it, you know, for the sake of completion. So when we come to surgery, uh, you know, uh, there are preoperative images which we require. Now, if I've decided that this patient has a 60 degree curve angle and, you know, requires surgery, then I will do a PA, AP spine erect film. I'll do a bending film. Now, the bending films can be done supine. Okay, they are supine bending films. They're not done with the patient standing. If there is a curve which is greater than 80 degrees, you do a traction film. Okay, the traction film is basically with, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody holding the leg and serious traction on the cervical spine. So, for example, this is a child, you know, who had a... Uh, main thoracic curve and you know you can see, appreciate the hypokyphosis uh, you know please appreciate the hypokyphosis on the lateral profile and then this child underwent surgery all right i'm showing you a similar curve okay of another patient same age again with a proximal you know main main thoracic curve but the difference here is that there is a little bit of kyphosis on the lateral view okay now, this patient, uh, you know, uh, I thought maybe this is not exactly an idiopathic. And if you look at the cervical spine carefully, you can see there's a little fusion of C23. And that's the MRI, you know, with a holocord, basically, big syrinx and uh, along carry malformation. Now, if you miss this and you decide to operate this child, uh, you know, you will possibly land up with a neurological deficit. And so this patient underwent a first stage uh, 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 foramen magnum decompression with a duroplasty. Uh, we did an MRI again after one year to check that the syrinx is reduced. Subsequently, this child underwent a uh, posterior spinal fusion with a slight undercorrection, you know, because we didn't want to uh, sort of stress the cord. So this brings me to the question of the MRI. So when do we do an MRI? So it is classically described that you need to do it in males if there is a left-sided curve, if there's kyphosis, if there's cervical dorsal curves, if there's asymmetric abdominal reflexes or any neurology, or if there's back pain. Uh, you know, sometimes you may have a child with a osteoid ostoma, something who may also have scoliosis. So, but is this really, you know, this is the classical teaching, but does this hold true? And uh, there is a recent uh, paper which is published in Spine Deformity just like uh, maybe a month ago. And they looked at a prospective evaluation of 198 patients, you know, both groups uh, with abnormal and normal MRIs and uh, with a mean age of 15 years, 
predominantly right thoracic curves, you know, which is supposed to be the normal one. They actually found neuroaxial uh, abnormalities in 25 patients, and both the groups had a similar proportion of atypical findings. Now, what they uh, sort of talked about was the number needed to diagnose and the number needed to misdiagnose. Okay, the management was changed before spinal fusion in 12% of the patients with the neuro neuroaxial anomalies, and the traditional risk factors did not predict. Uh, you know, the chance of a problem on the MRI. So uh, according to me, basically, this study tells us that, you know, you're safer doing an MRI if you're planning to operate. Now, this is a child, uh, you know, she's an idiopathic uh, scoliosis a girl whose uh, curve kept progressing. Uh, it's very important that, you know, what has been alluded to about the shoulder levels, etc. is looked at, but one needs to look at the flank and the flank asymmetry. Uh, one one sh should look at the, uh, you know, sort of uh, rib bump also. As in, we're 10 minutes done, we okay. can and go on for a couple of minutes. Basically, this is the x-ray and that shows the spondylolisthesis. Uh, it should not be missed. Okay. That's the bending film. Uh, there is a fulcrum bending, which is described. And uh, this is the MRI showing the spondylolisthesis. Uh, the radiograph uh, done intraoperatively. And that's the uh, fusion. Basically, the post-op imaging is usually done at uh, six months, one year, and two years. And you, can, you basically want to look at the residual curve. You want to look at what's happening at the area which you've not fused. Okay, so this is another patient uh, with the idiopathic scoliosis. All right, uh, you have to be able to see the entire spine very clearly. Uh, you know, so when you then need to do a scanogram sometimes, and you've got to assess the bending films, uh, look at the MRI. Okay, now uh, I'm talking about intraoperative imaging. You know, what is the role of intraoperative imaging? So one is for identifying the level. Second is to, uh, and you know, you got to then after putting your screws, you got to check your screws are properly placed. Now here you can see that the top screw is not uh, appropriately placed; it's a little lateral. So it's readjusted and then, you know, you recheck it. And uh, subsequently, after you put in the rods, you got to recheck again uh, to be sure that no screw has plowed. Uh, and then you check on the lateral also. And then look on the interop, you know, if you feel that, uh, you know, there is everything is good. All right. And that's what the patient looks like subsequently. Now, when, what are the indications for a CT or MRI uh, post-operatively? So it's really, if there is any neurological problem, uh, you may have, uh, you know, a mild breach like this, but sometimes you may have, uh, you know, a problem like this. So a CT should be done first if that happens, uh, MRI subsequently. All right. There are radiation hazards. Uh, one needs to be mindful of this and uh, we have to avoid it. You know, it's not something that you can just keep ordering x-rays for these children. And uh, there are effective doses which are described and, you know, how much one can give safely. And uh, that basically brings us, you know, to EOS, which is uh, uh, an advanced imaging, which is done in uh, two views with the, uh, in a functional position uh, to reduce the radiation uh, dose and uh, to look at the clinical parameters and also to optimize the patient care flow. And I believe in India, we only have it at AIMS and maybe uh, Dr. Bhau can talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Arjun. You covered a lot of ground in that time. So uh, just before the other faculty warms up to ask a few questions, Arjun, what is the prescription that, that, you, that an AI patient will leave with from your clinic? Uh, because you need to cover T1 to S1, etc. So is there a simple prescription that you can give out to people? So basically, I mean, the a simple logical way is look at the patient. You know, if the patient is short, you know that you're going to be able to get that on a X-ray dorsal lumbar spine and you just kind of write down that include from T1 to S1. If you feel that the patient is taller, you know, and you're not going to be able to get it on one X-ray, then rather than doing a scanogram, you know, which actually, actually involves four films, it's better to, you know, sort of try to talk to the radiology technician and say that, no, you can do this in two images, you know, versus, you know, you multiplying the radiation with every shoot, shoot you give. So uh, your clinical assessment of the height and, you know, you know what the uh, largest films available are. So usually it's very feasible to get it on two films, you know, at least you're not increasing the radiation dose, dosage then. So, so I would usually write... S1 keyword, T1 to S1 is a keyword. Any yeah. other keywords on your prescription? Erect, erect films, always erect. That has to be, you know, mentioned very, very clearly. And because if you have a supine film, it's really not, not useful at all because you can't compare it subsequently. And uh, no bending films if I'm not planning surgery. Great. Gautam, you have a question? Yeah, this is a question from Dr. S. Gautam from Cyan Hospital in Bombay. And he asks you, uh, Arjun, as to when the patient comes for the first time, I, and clinically I notice that there is an adolescent idiom, I mean a scoliosis, what X-ray should I order initially? Is lateral bending X-ray necessary in the initial picture? And, oh, and then subsequently, when the patient follows up, what X-ray should I order? Should I order AP lateral every time or is AP only enough? How does it go? And how frequently should I the, call the patient for a follow-up? Okay. So if we're talking about idiopathic, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, then you can ask for an X-ray dorsal lumbar spine 
if you feel that the child is not going to be able to get you not going to get that entire image then ask for a scanogram but ask them to do only two sort of plates versus four uh, the lateral film is necessary in the beginning it need not be put in every time uh, you know you are asking the, the to follow up the patient uh, six monthly but pre operatively yes so i'd like i'd like to get one uh, ap lateral initially then i'll follow it up with the ap and then get a ap lateral and bending prior to surgery if i right. put the child in a brace i would like to get an ap and lateral and how often will you call the patient back to your clinic to see them and when how often will you get your x rays done six monthly six monthly and the x ray initially six monthly if i feel that there is no progression happening then annually suppose this patient is suppose this patient is 10 11 years old just going into the growth spurt would it still be six monthly would it be shorter six would it be longer six, month. six monthly at, at at that age i would say six months so now and and i'll tell the parents that if you feel that the curve is increasing take a picture and kind of come back early if you feel there's you know something you're noting i think so what you're emphasizing is that we should not uh, ask for x rays until we absolutely sure yeah i mean yeah because there's a lot which you can understand on clinical examination including flexibility rohit you have a question i just wanted to get uh, arjun's uh, view on uh, push prone push prone films versus fulcrum uh, bending films i mean do you do you do you have a preference or is there any data out there which would tell you that fulcrum would be better than a push prone film i think a lot depends on who's doing the uh, you know uh, doing the bending film because there is a lot of variability and flexibility in how it's done uh, no i didn't ask for the bending films i uh, specifically was commenting on uh, push prone versus, versus uh, fulcrum i don't usually get it done i just ask for the i feel the ap lateral are sufficient to make any decision actually. does anyone in the faculty feel strongly about this push prone and fulcrum bending no one is really hard hard up on it there are two questions which are one question is directed directly to dr basu and that is from dr siddharth in kolkata and he asks uh, dr basu please give us your opinion about pre operative bending films versus traction films versus fulcrum bending films what is better or is there something that in certain circumstances one is better and in certain circumstances other is better thanks both uh, my take is that if i am evaluating a patient for surgery if i need to understand my x rays so far as choosing my uiv and liv is concerned i'll do the whole gamut of it that means bending films traction films and fulcrum bending films but if i'm just evaluating a patient to understand the the uh, deterioration of curvature if any i'd just stick to whole spine standing ap every 6 months or 1 year does this uh, the films that you order are they the traction film is done under anesthesia or without anesthesia without anesthesia and uh, bend, bending films are they supine voluntary always supine and forced or by somebody or for voluntary just as much as usually patient. my fellows know how to do it what uh, my uh, uh, teaching is that you have to push uh, i mean pull the wrist towards the pelvis as much as possible when you are making a supine bend film that's the way i ask my fellows to do it right okay and is there any difference between a thoracic and a lumbar curve in terms of what films you order no i always no. order a whole spine standing ap for evaluations every 6 months or 1 year and once the patient is up for surgery when i need to understand my fusion levels i would always do a whole spine standing ap standing lateral a whole spine supine bending ap right and left a fulcrum bending if it is a double major curve with a thoracic and a lumbar i do two fulcrum bendings for each of the curves and i'll do a traction film right thank you uh, abhay this question is specifically for you from dr priyesh of nagpur and he asks you sometimes in a high grade spondylolisthesis you find that the patient also has a scoliotic list or a curve uh does this knee or curve how do we evaluate this curve in terms of need for surgery and can we always tell the patient that uh, after surgery for the spondylolisthesis this curve will stabilize and may not require surgery the standard algorithm is that address the spondylolisthesis first uh, the evaluation in your head is that if the curve on top has a but as a is a curve of a defined pattern the patterns that have been described you may want, and if if it's of a higher denomination and the child is of an older age these are all gray zones uh it's likely that that may need to be addressed later if you still want to evaluate that you should give it at least one year which is a, a arbitrary time because that's not been defined 
if the curve on the other hand is of uh, of an um, of uh, not a pattern that's been described it's a out of line curve if it's a lower denomination curve and if the child is younger uh, i would tend to tell them that just hang on and the anesthesia surgery will take care of it thank you one last question i think uh, bhau you wanted to ask no amit amit was asking yeah, about uh, what are, what is the role of ct scan uh, because sometimes you don't see in the full length the upper upper thoracic lateral views and the uh, the ct scan will show all the vertebrae very well and that's very important to measure the curves in lateral because sometimes it's difficult to find the upper uh, uh, vertebrae so actually in now lateral. if you look at you know if you look at the radiation exposure with the low dose ct which is done now it's actually almost comparable to radiographs so yeah. you know if you require to do it it's fine to do it if you feel it's going to help you with the planning etc and you want to assess Uh, uh, but then i would sort of look at what i can avoid you know and what i would sort of uh, try because i i mean one needs to look at the radiation risks uh, with with how much we are doing uh, it it's it's fairly straightforward to clinically sort of correlate everything that you're seeing and combine it with what radiographs you have i think guys for lack of time forward. let's whisk forward because it's 450 and we just done with two two lectures i'm sorry for that uh, we'll move on to the third topic and that's uh, presented by dr amit jhala who rep- who is uh, represented gujarat with so much flavor all these years in the assi and you would think that he's only an olive surgeon or an mi surgeon but his bulk of work is actually deformity surgery and amit is going to talk to us about the most important part of evaluating a uh, scoliosis x-ray and that is the strategic vertebrae over to you amit bhai uh thank you assi thank you abhay uh, after clinical evaluation and imaging i think when the patient comes to you uh for surgery i think this strategic vertebrae are very very important for evaluation of these curves and uh if you see these three x rays uh this is the x ray which is of course a thoracic curve this is again a thoracic curve and this is again a thoracic curve you can see that these three uh, curves have been managed uh, the curve patterns are also same but the severity increases but the method in which the strategies for the use of the implants are different in all the three uh, curve patterns and the my question my main question is there are three different strategies to correct nearly a similar curve and the important point is uh key point is important to correct the deformity but where to start and where to end it's very very important when you are planning the surgery and where and what type of force to apply to correct the deformity is also equally important to correct deformity and that is where the role of strategic vertebras come because you have to apply the forces and you have to include this strategic vertebra uh in the uh in the in the uh, uh surgery so what is the role of strategic vertebra if you see the uh, curves there are usually three curves which are there in a scoliosis one is a primary curve and there are two compensatory curves so these are the three curves so what does the strategic vertebra uh, how does the strategic vertebra help it helps to identify the part of the curve that means which is the major curve which is the compensatory curve by evaluating the end vertebras for each of them it also helps for selection of the fusion levels that means what which is the neutral vertebra which is the stable vertebra which is the uh, end vertebra and it also helps to instrument and apply desired forces at different strategic vertebra like what type if you want you have to always uh, instrument the apical vertebra you have to derotate the apical vertebra so these important terminologies are very very important if you want to plan the surgery and let's move forward and off sorry oh there was some error i need to reload it I'm sorry for that. Okay. So it's very important to identify the strategic vertebra to identify the curve for selection of the fusion levels and uh, where to instrument uh, especially when you want uh, to uh, plan the surgery 
And the common vertebras that we need to know are the apical vertebras, the end vertebras, the neutral vertebras, the intermediate vertebra, and the stable vertebra. You, where should be the UIV and where should be the LIV? And the newer concepts I'll just touch upon is the last touch vertebra and the last substantially touch vertebras. I think they are very, very strategically important vertebras if you want to plan for surgery. So what are the radiographs which are required, which was very much uh, uh, elaborated by uh, Dr. Dawale. But what you require if you want to plan the surgery is a standing full length AP films, standing full length lateral films, and Ramit supine Kaur, uh, bending films. Is not visible. And these are very important that you should always see T1, you should always see the uh, sacrum in, uh, in AP full the length, and you should lost. always see the full length uh, spine in the, in the lateral the view. I and mean, in supine bending slides. also, it is very important to check for the T1 I mean, and... We can't T1. see your slides. Your slide share is gone. So it's warming up very well. As you can see, we are well over time, but I think it's worth the, worth the while because uh, cases are also being seen in these lectures. So at the end of the six lectures, if you don't have time for case discussion, it should be okay because most of what you want to learn will be, is going to be covered uh, through these lectures. Um, any, any questions until now for uh, Dr. Amit? I have a very basic... Uh, Rohit, you're muted. Rohit, you want to ask something? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just wondering whether Abhay would like to chip in with a quick case uh, while Amit loads up his slides. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always, oh, he yeah. doesn't want me to because he's... Okay, while you are loading, uh, Arjun, question for you. Which curves are braceable? In adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, when would you consider brace? Is every curve, is an upper thoracic curve, which is between 25 and 40, braceable? So how do you, what advice would you give to the people uh, people who are watching this kid, which curves are braceable and when would you consider surgery in adolescent idiopathic Can surgery? you see? Can you see my screen now? We can see, but the screen is locked. There's uh, nothing is moving on the screen. We can see the home screen, like your presentation box. Why it's moving here? Until then, Arjun, can you unmute and take that answer? So, uh, yeah, you to add the questions. Add to the question, question, Arjun. Arjun, to add to Gautam's question, how do you do your bracing? Do you have a standard format or who, what do you tell your brace maker? That could be added to this answer as well. Right. So basically, uh, the bracing will work. There is a, it's unquestioned that bracing works. Uh, you know, Stuart Weinstein has come out now with the brace can you style. See can, can. Okay. And uh, it will work for a, uh, basically the best one is the thoracic. The main thoracic curve is the best one to brace. It should be a total contact brace, like a Boston brace or Wilmington brace. They should make a negative uh, sort of uh, uh, impression with traction and then basically uh, uh, prepare the, uh, the brace. There is a CAD CAM technology now which is used. Okay, If you have a higher curve, uh, sort of higher uh, proximal curve, then you need to give a Milwaukee type brace, sort of a proper, uh, including the cervical. So any apex above D6, then you have to go uh, up to the cervical sort of area. Lower lumbar, uh, you know, not really, it, I don't think it works so well for them. You need to kind of then uh, stabilize the pelvis. But bracing has a good role if the child is compliant and for a skeletally immature patient with RISA less than two uh, and uh, for a thinner patient. Yes. Lovely. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Amin. Yeah. So, uh, so these are the X-ray films that usually I, uh, I do in this uh, patients. You can see that you have to, you have to see the T1, you have to see the S1. And not only in the standing, but also in the lateral bending, in both the bending as well as a full length lateral. Only if you have these planning, this x-rays, you can plan the surgery very well. So it's very imperative to have these uh, primary x-rays before de for determining the strategic vertebra. There are certain optional films which may not be required as a routine, like lateral films in flexion and extension, traction films and push prone films, but they are not absolutely mandatory. Uh, they may be required as an optional examination to find out the strategic vertebras. So what are the strategic vertebra? The first is the apical vertebra. This is one of the most important vertebra because that is where actually the apex of the primary curve lies. And how to identify that apical vertebra? You have to draw the tangent there and the most horizontal vertebra which is there in the curve is the, on the standing AP films is the apical vertebra. It is also the most rotated vertebra because that is the apex of the curve. 
it is a most deformed or trapezoid curve if you see this there is a trapezoid vertebra here so it is a most deformed vertebra most rotated vertebra most horizontal vertebra and it is most deviated from the center sacral line so if you draw a line here this is the most uh, deviated from the csvl so that's how you can identify the apical vertebra and what is the importance and the other important thing is that if you see that usually in thoracic spine the uh, the vertebra is the apex but in the lumbar spine usually the disc makes the apex like l23 or l34 disc comes as an apex if you have the disc as the apex you must consider lower vertebra as your apical vertebra right these these are the basic things that which are very important now what is the importance of this apical vertebra it's important to instrument the apical vertebra when you do a surgery because it will if you if you just put the screw there if you just put put the screws on the convex side and putting the screw you can actually derotate the whole spine and you can push the convex side down and that will help in derotation of the spine and decrease the hump and that's why to instrument apical vertebra is very very important if you want to go for the surgery and this is one of the example if you see this curve this is the apical region and you must have the maximum amount of implants which will derotate derotate the whole spine as well as push the convex side inside uh, to push the convex side so that you can get a decrease in the hip rib hump so it's very important to uh, uh, instrument these apical vertebras and to apply the forces there so it's a very important strategic vertebra the other important vertebra are the end vertebras end vertebras are very important they are the most tilted vertebra in the curve if you see this is the curve this is the most tilted vertebra and when you take the bending films the upper disc spaces will open up on both the both the bending films and the other important thing is that this becomes parallel uh, below it so below it the discs are parallel upper discs are always opening up in both the bending films you should not only take this uh, uh, ap views it's very important to check this vertebras in lateral films also because sometimes in thoracic lumbar junction you can get uh, uh, some kyphosis is there and if you stop your instrumentation at the kyphosis then you may have a problem of this distal junctional kyphosis so you must uh, must see the lateral films before you embark on the end vertebra so both are very important ap and lateral films to mark your end vertebra so this is one of the film where you can see this is central sacral line t4 is the most tilted which is the upper end vertebra t11 is the most tilted which is the lower end vertebra and uh, so that's how you measure the cob angle from the upper end plate to the lower end plate uh, and that's how you measure the uh, cob angle in this case patients the most important thing in planning is it should always be included in the fusion the fusion should go and include the end vertebras and that's the basic point you should never leave these end vertebra coming to the neutral vertebra neutral vertebra they are neutrally rotated so neutral rotation means that if you see the nash and mo criteria you should have pedicles equidistant from the spinous process you should see full round pedicles it should be very near the, these neutral vertebra are very near the csvl and it marks the end of the primary curve and that start the then after the neutral vertebra the curve started starts rotating for the compensatory vertebra lower down or upper uh, upper vertebra and therefore because it is also considered as the last vertebra for the primary curve it is important in selection of the liv or uiv for the fusion levels so that's very important so if you see this x ray this is a neutrally rotated vertebra upper neutral vertebra and this is the lower neutral vertebra okay where you can see this uh, this uh, pedicles very nicely there is a concept of intermediate vertebra which was given by cd each primary curve is divided into three one is a periapical region which is a very rigid curve and the other two are slightly flexible so if you want to differentiate between these two you have your convex bending films and you can see that periapical between the end vertebra and the periapical region there is opening of the disc space and that is a more flexible part of the rigid curve or a primary curve which is there and that's why it's very important to find out that and you can see this is the curve and you can see that convex bending and you can see that d1112 the d12 is the end vertebra here but d1112 is already opening so d11 becomes your intermediate vertebra and there is it's very important because this is more of a flexible curve and you can either instrument or don't instrument that to get uh, depending on your implant density and what is the flexibility of the curve and if this is a simple curve curves greater than 40 with high flexible you can just 
just uh, uh, just instrument the upper end vertebra lower end vertebra one screw in the apical region and two screws in the periapical region and do a compression and distraction and that is sufficient and this is a recent paper which is the key vertebral screw strategy if it's a more flexible curve so it's very important that you identify where to apply the forces and identify your strategic vertebra the next important thing is the stable zone and the stable vertebra harrington gave the stable zone concept wherein uh, the vertebral bodies within the lines which are going through the uh, lumbosacral facets they form the stable zone and the last or the first vertebra which forms in the stable zone is known as the stable vertebra that was the concept by the harrington which was changed by king where he said that you just draw a central sacral line and the vertebra which is bisected equally forms the stable vertebra and this is the concept which is followed as on today also if you want that there should not be any adding on so if you fuse if your fusion extends up to the stable vertebra there is a very very less chance of adding on phenomena so it's very important to find out the stable vertebra also now are neutral end and stable vertebra same no they are they can be same or they can be different and you can see here this is the end vertebra which is d12 here l1 is the neutral vertebra and and the l2 is the stable vertebra so you are you must fuse up to the neutral vertebra or the stable vertebra in this case so it's very important to find out which are these three strategic vertebras to uh, to identify your fusion levels so what are the general guidelines on this on this strategic vertebra selection the general guidelines is end vertebra should always be included in the fusion level neutral vertebra should be included in the fusion level lower end of the fusion should go up to the stable vertebra and end vertebra should be checked in lateral x ray to avoid a distal junctional kyphosis because if there is a kyphosis you have to go you have to fuse that segment also and on bending films if the lower end what if the disc below the liv is opening on bending films in both then you can uh, then that is the safest where you will not have any add on phenomena so if you see this then this is the stable vertebra uh, and then if you instrument till stable vertebra then your fusion is absolutely absolutely fine and you will have a good coronal and sagittal balance and there will be no adding on phenomena so these are the general strategies now this strategic vertebra uh, the and how to plan your selection was given by harrington and he said that you should go up to the lower level should fall in the harrington stable zone the mo changed the concept in and said that neutrally rotated vertebra above and neutrally rotated vertebra below should be included in the fusion level and the king and what we all usually follow is the king king criteria the end vertebra and the neutral vertebra above to the stable vertebra and more lumbar segments are fused because you are going up to the stable vertebra so if you go up to the stable vertebra you fuse more lumbar segments and if you fuse more lumbar segments 60 to 82% of the patients will have some type of back pain uh, in long term and therefore the concept of selective thoracic fusion came to fuse the least number of the motion segments in the lumbar region and this was possible because of the pedicle screw constructs and you can have a selective thoracic fusion in some type of the curves but you have to be careful that if your selection is not proper you may have a risk of adding on which can occur in around 20% of the cases Amit, so the concept so? yeah yes, this yes, is the last thank you last so the concept of the last substantially touched vertebra and last touch vertebra came to have a selective thoracic fusion so if you have a central sacral line which is drawn here your l4 forms the stable vertebra and the neutral vertebra if the central sacral line goes medial to the pedicle above it is known as last substantially touched vertebra and any part of the body if it is touched by the central sacral line it comes to the last touch vertebra so these both vertebras are very important if you want to have a selective thoracic fusion so this is an example if you see this is the if here if you see the stable vertebra is l4 here but the last touch vertebra is l2 so we have fused up to the l2 and fusing up to l2 we have saved two motion segments by not following the concept of stable vertebra similarly in this curve if you see the la, the stable vertebra is l4 but the last touch vertebra is l3 we stopped at l3 and we could save three segments below the fusion level so that's the importance of the last touch vertebra and last uh, substantially touch vertebra the last point is about the upper end strategic vertebra 
which should be fused in the upper end usually this is what we follow if you want to have a good shoulder level you should see clinically which shoulder is elevated if the left shoulder is elevated we go up to t2 if the right shoulder is elevated we go up to t4 and if the shoulders are level it is up to t3 and this is a general rule that is followed which was given by probe chatel and this is a recent paper which is just mslv which is just recently recently published and what the concept says is it is just reverse to the uh, last touch vertebra you draw a line from csvl to the liv and the last touch vertebra here it is known as mslv if you select this vertebra then you will have a c7 plumb line in line with the liv which will give a good coronal balance as well as a shoulder balance if you follow this concept you will have a good shoulder balance and a good three dimensional correction uh, of the upper vertebra so that's what it is some clinical okay. examples or i may just move yeah, on yeah we can skip that i mean the clinical gap because so you I'll will just uh, yeah. i'll just skip all these things and come to my last uh, slide so that's the last uh, slide I fully appreciate. We had asked you to give you clinical examples, but uh, we are running short so of the time. The take home is the take home is. Uh, very important to identify the strategic vertebras. You must have a full length and bending radiographs. Very important to identify these strategic vertebras. They are important for planning the fusion levels, especially UIV and LIV. stable vertebra is important if strategic placements of implants are planned to decrease the implant density and placing the implants at the strategic vertebra can apply strong effective corrective forces to the rigid segments of the scoliosis to correct the deformity and achieve global spinal balance i think it's very important to have the strategic vertebra thank you yes lot of strategic information from the master himself thank you uh, amit bhai for that Uh, before you finish your questions uh, and uh, lecture there are questions floating in so rohit do you want to take the first shot yeah amit bhai thanks so much for a great talk sorry we missed all those clinical examples quick question to you you talked about the stable vertebrae but you showed us the ap view where you use the csvl and you assess the bisecting pedicles what about the lateral view do you also take a line with always always so i have not put it here but that's what i said that the pre operative lateral view is very important the strategic stable vertebra in sagittal view also should be bisected yeah yeah right yeah the question alluding to the stable vertebra amit was that since every uh, spine has three curves and each curve will have its own end vertebra and own neutral vertebra own uh, so what about the stable vertebra would you consider one stable vertebra per curve or the lowest of the stable vertebra of the spine is considered the stable vertebra lowest of the vertebra of the spine i'll consider as a stable vertebra because that's where you want your liv Right. right so, so when you are doing a selective fusion that rule may not apply then you may want so to so for selective thoracic fusion you might have to go to the upper cuff which is bisecting there right. so if it is one c cuff then you might have to go to the upper cuff right Great. and see how much correction of the lumbar cuff is happening Great. any other questions from uh, the audience or from the faculty if not we will uh, discreetly move on to the next talk thank you so much amit bhai it was fantastic and i know you got so much to say so much uh, you know to learn from you but uh, you tried to do you know justice and you did i think thank you for the lovely talk we move on to uh, the delhi daredevil from aims uh, dr bhau gar congratulations on your 100 publication your uh, you know your effervescent in your research and your publications and uh, you know again you are a torch bearer for the next uh, generation if i may say so um, you are going to talk to us about classifications we are always flummoxed with what classification to follow the lenky pattern has more than 60 or 70 different curve patterns so it's difficult for us old people to uh, digest and to identify that you're going to tell us the easy way out uh, over to you bhavuk you un uh, can you unmute and get on uh, get online yeah is it okay now uh. so uh, the question arises you know is it really important to know about the um, the classification in ais and as a surgeons we are always happy you know whatever we do uh and we always think that nothing is difficult for us as a spine surgeon whatever we do is the best and we always have a tendency to you know just do it uh, whatever comes uh, whatever type of curve is there we tend to just do it uh, for this thing but then uh, you know somewhere you realize that the accidents are happening and when they happen in succession then you uh, feel the re uh, the need of actual uh, classification that how you can compare your uh, 
cases with the other uh, described cases so you can have an understanding and you can have organize an approach to their problem and then how can you you, you use your clinical decision making and there comes the role of these uh, classification and especially for the research and documentations and al also these classifications they need to have a good inter and inter observer classification we know that not every curve is similar and no similar classification for every curve and not all classification they serve all the purpose a lengthy 40 degree curve in two different patients may not be the same uh, curve and earlier, uh, the various uh, authors, they just try to uh, uh, classify the scoliosis depending upon the pathology, depending upon the position of the apex, which we still follow as per the SRS definition about the thoracic, if the apex is between T2 to T11, T12 disc, and the lumbar, if the apex is T, L1, L2 disc to the L4, and the thoracolumbar is in between. Uh, Rohit beautifully covered, you know, what is infantile, juvenile. So we know that the AIS is a diagnosis by exclusion, and it is the most common. The people... Earlier, they tried to classify them depending upon the location of the curves. But the as the spine surgeons, our basic question remains, you know, which curve to fuse? If there are two curves, then can we leave one, which we call as a selective fusion? And if we are going to do, what should be our fusion levels? And the classification to answer, answer that. First classification tried to answer that is the King's Moo classification. And uh, it tried to divide them into five types. Uh, and the important thing is to realize this type two, which is the main uh, sort of uh, contention in, in this King's uh, classification when the thoracic curve is larger than the lumbar. And there were different recommendations. I'm not going to detail, but the important thing is that this classification brought the concept of selective fusion that we can fuse a major curve in the presence of two curves and we can leave a minor curve. Uh, so this remained the standard from early 80s to late 90s. And then um, uh, the criticism started coming up that they are not uh, covering the thoracolumbar and the lumbar deformities and they are not covering the sagittal deformities the sagittal plane as well and uh, the lumbar curves they can actually decompensate especially the type 2 which i discussed uh, this thing after selective thoracic fusion and then uh, the uh, the lenke said that you know you are missing actually the double major curves you are missing the structural lumbar curve in the two king two curve and then the the concept of thoracic sagittal alignment also came and then uh, people started reporting that the inter observer and the inter observer reliability is also not good with the King's classification, especially with the Lenke group. And then the Lenke came up with his own classification, which we all follow uh, most of the times, and it divided them into several types, we are, which we are just going to discuss in the coming slides. So the first step in Lenke remains that we identify the curve type. There are basically three main types, proximal thoracic, main thoracic, and thoracolumbar lumbar curves, depending upon the apex of the uh, that particular curve. Major curve is the, always the largest curve measurement, which always remains the structure. Mm -hmm. And the minor curve, we have some structural criteria. Like if the uh, curve is considered structural, if on side bending, it remains less than 25 degrees, whether it is proximal thoracic, whether it is main thoracic, or whether it is thoracolumbar, if on side bending, it remains more than 25, then it is considered as structural. And we also look at the kyphosis of that segment. If it is more than 20 degree, then we also consider it as a structural curve. So basically, he divided them into six types. Uh, the the Lenke 1 main thoracic, Lenke 2 is double thoracic when the proximal thoracic and main thoracic. Lenke 3 is uh, again main thoracic with the uh, with all the the, uh, with the the lumbar major and the triple major when there's a proximal thoracic curve as well. And then the thoracolumbar and thoracolumbar is a major curve. We we add if we had just started to follow that, we may not remember, but once you start using them, then it becomes a very uh, you know very easy to uh, summarize uh, these and uh, remember these curve patterns. So this is an example of a main thoracic curve. You can see there's a 70 degree structural curve. And on bending, if you look at the, um, the curves, uh, the only the main thoracic remains the structure. The other curves, they, they straighten to less than 25 degrees. So this is a, a main thoracic curve, which we call as the Lenke 1. Uh, now, this one looks like a, a Lenke 5 curve, if you look at this thing. But again, if you try to measure the curves, then you realize that the corpse of the, the thoracic curve is also uh, uh, of 40, uh, more than this thing. But on bending, it also remains structural. It is more than 37 degrees. So it becomes a Lenke 6 now. So the objectivity is very important. They just don't realize on your eyes that this looks like this thing. So always, always measure the angles and then you realize that sometimes you miss. And you have to look around every corner of the X-ray when you see these X, these classifications. So like this curve, it, this looks like a Lenke 1 curve. But if you look at the thoracolumbar junction, there is a kyphosis as well. So automatically it goes into a Lenke 3 curve. So Lenke, it, has, it becomes from Lenke 1 to Lenke 3. And it, it is essential to include this curve as well into the fusion. Larger curves, if you see, they may disguise these small curves. Like in this curve, uh, it looks like a Lenke 5 curve. But if you actually measure the thoracic curve, then it comes out to be a major curve. And also you have to look at the, again, the thoracolumbar, there is a kyphosis as well. So again, this requires both curves to be fused for the optimal outcome.
now it is essential to re recognize the proximal thoracic curves uh, like in this curve you can see that somehow i missed the the proximal thoracic curve and you can see that the preoperatively both the shoulders were the same level but when we fuse this thing then we realize that we missed the proximal thoracic and now it has gone to the uh, the other side uh, so it was actually not a lenke 1 it was a lenke 2a curve so recognizing a proximal thoracic curve is important like in this case we could have missed the proximal thoracic but actually we could recognize and we we go we went a little bit higher so to include the proximal thoracic curve as well the second step of classification remains the identification of lumbar modifiers in so as dr jhala told us about the central sector vertical line so we look at the uh, the upright coronal x rays and if there is a pelvic obliquity you have to balance it and you look at the uh, the csvl if it is bisecting the apical most vertebra the apex then you can say that it is the type a if it is just touching the pedicle and the lateral vertebral wall in between then it is type b and if it is completely off then it is type c so if if there is a controversy between a versus b and b versus c we always take as a b because we always aim for selective fusion so like in this thing we we draw a csvl and it is bisecting the apical vertebra so this is the uh, type a so this is lenke 1a this is the same curve which we, we chose earlier so uh, another important thing is to look at the l4 tilt tilt Uh, if the L4 is tilted towards the concavity of the curve or the towards the left, then we call it as a 1A L. 1A L behaves like 1A B. So the uh, the the stable vertebra is a little bit higher in 1A L. While if the L4 is tilted towards the right, that is towards the convexity of the curve, then these curves they are very notorious to be uh, a risk of adding on, and there the stable vertebra is a little bit distal. So one has to be very careful. Like in this case, this is 1A R curve, and if you look at the last touch vertebra is L2, while the stable vertebra is L3. we stopped at l2 uh, as per the you know the uh, the the sug guidelines and the lenke guidelines and we had a adding on phenomena later on while in this curve again a 1a r curve we fused it up to the stable vertebra and we could have a good outcome so it is very important to look at the 1a r curve the third step is to identify the thoracic sagittal modifiers we go from t5 to t12 because t2 to t5 is not visible usually in x ray so we go up to t5 to t12 and we look at the hypokyphotic curves and the hyperkyphotic curves the important thing is to differentiate is because you chose your method of correction intraoperatively if it is hypokyphotic curve then you apply your concave rod first and if it is hyperkyphotic uh, curve then you apply your convex rod first in your correction so like in this case we look at the thoracic uh, parameter uh, thoracic sagittal uh, parameter and it is 8 degree so this is the lenke 1a minus so actually if you look at the lenke classification it has got six main curve types and there are 14 subtypes if we don't add thoracic and total there are 42 subtypes with all modifiers by definition 5 and 6 they are always c curves they don't have a and b and people initially reported very good inter and intra observer uh, validity major curve is always included in the fuser and minor curve is included only if they are structural so lenke allowed us to first time to differentiate between true king two curves and the double major curves then came the different criteria that this is not okay then we can also go for selective fusion in lenke 3 lenke 6 and lenke 1 also and people gave us different concepts like steve richards criteria and the kamal ibrahim criteria and the lenke also gave us you know the ratio criteria by which we can uh, do a ratio of the cobs apical vertebral translation apical vertebral ratio uh, this thing rotation and the flexibility they also gave us some clinical criteria also and basis on this thing we can decide whether to we go for selective thoracic fusion or not but they don't always work like in this case the cobs is uh, 1.3 uh, ratio is 1.3 and the avt and the avr is 1.1 so by definition we should not go for selective fusion but we had a good outcome in this by doing just doing the selective th th thoracic fusion so uh, and we had a good clinical outcome this is another case in which again the the all criteria fixed uh, uh, told us to go for selective thoracic fusion and the surgeon chose to go anterior in this and he just do a, a selective uh, lumbar fusion anteriorly but again it progressed uh, you know in, in, in the in the follow up and it has a very drastic outcome so again we had to operate and we had to go posterior and we had to include both the curves in in, in for correction so uh lenke gave us the apical vertebral translation is the most important but there is no criteria there is no guidelines that how many of these criteria should be met and what combination of ratio should be used to perform a selective fusion and now people have started recognizing that there is a problem with lenke classification as well so it is a more comprehensive as classification it provides a template for the selection of fusion levels but still it is complex and the now people are rec uh, recognizing that there are some limitations as well and the other authors they are unable to produce similar reliable studies and it gives fusion region guidelines but it doesn't give the fusion level uh, guidelines and it is a 2d system which is a while we know that the scoliosis is a 3d like this is a lenke 1 all these curves they are lenke 1 but they are all different so you can see that there is a large variability that from t2 to t11 t12 disc there are so many curve patterns in between but we all they are just given a broad basket of lenke 1a 
and now people have reported that there are so many uh, inter and intra observer uh, reliability is not good but the common ground with king and lenke is that they all have surgical relevance and they all, all give the concept of towards the selective thoracic fusions people have also now recognizing the sh uh, shoulder and the pelvis also account uh, into consideration that we have to uh, include the pelvic obliquity as well so some so if the the pelvis is uh, after correcting your limb length inequality if the pelvis is tilted towards the concavity then we curve uh, we include it as a pelvis included and you have to go at least to l Four in these cases, and if the pelvis is excluded, that it is direct towards the convexity, then you can end at L1. So Lenke and King they do not adequately address the proximal level of fusion. This is also this thing. So one has to consider the T1 tilt as well. Uh, Kings and Lenke like they also don't match in most of the times. So like King type two, they say that you just fuse only thoracic, while the Lenke one C says that it is the non-selective fusion. So people have looked at the comparison, but actually, if you follow any of these guidelines, the clinical outcome doesn't matter. But yes, uh, the radiological picture may not match. The another concept came up with the PUMC classification, in which they divided them into three apexes, depending on the number of the apexes, and they produce good. They in their study they produce good reliability. But again, the Lenke and the PUMC don't match. They some, sometimes the Lenke one C says that you go for selective thoracic fusion, but the PUMC type says that you have to go for non-selective fusion. And we looked at, you know, we compared the both the classifications, and again, you know, uh, the Lenke classification recommended shorter fusion. But there was no statistically significant difference in the outcome measures if we follow this thing. Now coming to this case, you can see that there is a very severe uh, thoracic curve. You can see here, and if you look at the this curve, this X-ray, uh, you can see that there is a very severe curve, and it progressed rapidly within last within uh, six months, and the curves became 127.2 degrees. So this is a very severe curve. So this you can classify with the help of the Lenke curve. It will be a Lenke 1A curve, but Or maybe a Lenke two, depending upon the thoracic this thing. But if you look at the uh, if you look at these uh, CT scans, then you can see that this uh, at the just span of three uh, vertebra, this is total 180 degree rotation. So the D4 is rotated towards complete rotation one side, and the D6 is rotated towards the complete side, and the the D5 is actually neutral. It's a neutral. So these sort of classifications do not cover this thing. These uh, this thing. There is no category in Lenke, King, or PUMC for these cases, and Uh, these cases they require special maneuvers. There is no guidelines to treat, treat these maneuvers at how to control the rotation in this thing. So you have to uh, devise your strategies accordingly as per the cases this thing. But you can achieve good outcome if you pay attention to all these factors. So people are looking at the SRS is looking at the 3D cl classification as well. Last case you can see here. If you look clinically, that you can see that there is a very severe thoracic curve. But if you look clinically, there is a significant rotational deformity in this uh, in the cervical spine as well. So when you look at the X-ray, you can see that there is a curve 105 degrees with a even tilt of 80 degrees. Again, you cannot classify these curves in any category of Lenke, King, or the PUMC for these cases. And you require, you know, special measures. You have to go for derotation maneuver. How to derotate the cervical spine? So you require special measures. So again, you you have to be very careful and you have to individualize your approach. So to summarize, uh, the classification systems are there, and you have to rely on your clinical experience and individualized approach. And we have to see well how we can incorporate the clinical situations, including the the rotation, including the uh, peak height velocity, including the timing of the X-rays into these uh, our uh, uh, decision category. So science is the systematic classification of experience, but to be beyond any existing classification has always pleased me. Thank you all. Thank you, Bhau, for taking your time. That opens up an opportunity to ask you a few questions. Uh, you comprehensively covered the lengthy classification, but what do you follow in practice? So uh, I follow lengthy most of the times, but we also uh, try to look at rule breakers always because uh, now we have seen that there are so many rule breakers now. So uh, one has to be aware of these rule breakers. So lengthy is uh, you know the most commonly most of the cases or ninety percent of the cases you can just handle with lengthy classification. Right, and do you think that the uh, that the take homes from the lengthy that if this is this type of a curve, this surgery, these are the fusion levels. Do you think that also in, it ends up matching up? Uh, as I told you, that in most of the cases, yes. But again, it gives you a concept, you know, that how to think about this scoliosis, how Correct. to think about yeah. classification. So yeah. once you start using lengthy, then you also start recognizing, you know, its uh, its uh, limitations and this thing. So this is also important to follow some sort of classifications. This Dr. Dilip Singh Gupta told me, you know, if you follow a classification, then you will start looking at your own classification that how you can improve it and how you can uh, look at the the problems associated with it. Awesome! Thanks for bringing that very very illustrious name on the table, Dr. Dilip Singh Gupta, who has been mentor to so many of us, including our next dynamic speaker. Any other comments from the speakers on the cl on classification systems? Anything you strongly feel about? Because I think the sum up is that you got to know how the classifier thought. 
apply those thoughts to your method and make your own method you don't have to necessarily pigeon hole yourself into one classification so uh, moving on to a very illustrious speaker who is probably the first name in scoliosis surgery in our country he was the first mover also a product from the dilip sen sen gupta school of uh, scoliosis if you may like many of us are but uh, in his own right he there is now a basu school of scoliosis in uh, located in uh, the east of india and leading the eastern front um, i won't call him a kolkata night rider he sleeps early wakes up early starts his day with a morning run but uh, surely he uh, you know he is the flag bearer of scoliosis um, he is the indian flag bearer in the srs and uh, he is my dear friend dr somesh basu and now we're moving on after listening to clinical assessment imaging a uh, basic uh, strategic vertebrate classification and moving on now to surgical planning which is the real head hunting if you may when you actually come down to treating scoliosis surgery over to you samu thank you bhai for all those kind words uh, uh, disclaimer number 1 is give me a bell 1 minute before i need to finish because this is a huge topic and finishing off in time is a challenge what's happening here samu just to update everyone is that we are going to miss out on the case discussion because we are way over time but each lecture is so important that we are going to use your lecture as a part of case discussion so we'll give you some leeway in time right thank you thanks uh, thanks abhay um, I, i will concentrate on the selection of fusion levels understanding that uh, already the classification system has been covered in details and uh, rajesh is going to talk to you about various correction maneuvers so just stick to um the basic principles of uh, selection of fusion levels so we all know that the basic principles of surgery are that the um, it should be lowest morbidity least number of vertebrae fused both sagittal and coronal correction and to prevent further progression not to achieve maximum straight spine is the goal of the surgery and we need to realize that cosmetic outcome is as important if not more important than radiological outcome the principles laid down by bridwell in 1994 still holds good but they are very difficult to manage it's very easy to say that top and bottom of the fusion is within stable zone shoulders pelvis level if the fusion extends below l2 the liv should be neutral centered on the sacrum and horizontal to the sacrum again easier said than done so what i'll do is i'll first try to tell you the basics of fusion that is fuse all major curves Uh, which includes neutral cephalot neutral caudal and of course try to end the fusion at a stable zone that is what is a no brainer and many of the kids down the block would uh, assume that these are already there but the basic principles come in when we really consider that the two pearls which were given by Douglas Burton and Mark Asher a few decades back that never end your fusion above a kyphotic disc space and never leave or try to leave three or more distal motion segments is the basis of all the confusion which is there in the eis literature in the last two decades now to to start with this confusion i would not say as a solution to this confusion was this massive publication of lenky in which he described three areas and two types of curves one is a major curve with the maximum curve and a minor curve which is less than the maximum curve but it might be structural and non structural this has been dealt with in detail so i'm not going to this i just stop here for a moment to tell you that there are basically two types of flanky curves type 1 and 5 are c shaped that means they have only one structural curve so it's obviously a no brainer that this curve only needs to be fused and 2 3 and 6 are all s shaped curve that means they have two structural components and obviously both these structural curves needs to be fixed Type four is the rarest, three percent in Lenky's uh, uh, classification system, and all three needs to be fused. Now, if you look at an X-ray which has a major thoracic curve of sixty with a proximal thoracic of twenty-six and a lower lumbar of forty-five, and they bend down, the thoracic bends down to thirty-five. Whereas, it is important to look at the fact that the lumbar bends down to twenty-six, and therefore it is a structural minor curve, and the thoracic bends down to five. which means that it is a non structural minor curve so obviously all major curves and structural minor curve needs to be fused the last uh, indian spine journal issue was a symposium based on ais and the lenky group has written extensively about current concepts and level selection and I urge all of you to go through this and this is a table taken out from that article in which he said 
he says that way back in 1962, Harrington came up with the stable zone and then uh, coming on to the neutral vertebra by Moe, as uh, Dr. Chala has pointed out. Then the King uh, classification came into vogue, 83, in which the concept of CSVL was put in. And so 2003 onwards started to say that there are basically two types of curves. One in which you go one beyond the neutral vertebra or the end vertebra of a particular curve, and one you stick to the end vertebra, cob to cob. That means end to end. He came back in 2011 with those. And subsequently, as you walk down the lanes of history, we find that in 2010 and 2013 came the concept of the LTV, which is the least touched vertebra, as Amit has also pointed out. And then there was the LSTV, that means least substantially touched vertebra, which came in. And finally, uh, we know that Kim et al. has proved that the sagittal stable vertebra, that means the end vertebra, I mean the lower instrumented vertebra, not only looks, uh, uh, not only needs to be looked upon as in the coronal plane, but also in the sagittal plane as the sagittal stable vertebra, which Rohit had kindly pointed out. So in the next few minutes, what I'll do is I'll breeze across lengthy one, and then again lengthy three, five, three and six, and then come back to five. So in lengthy one curves, as is a typical example, 70 degree curve going down to 40 degree on the bin on the attraction films, you see here, if you mark out the vertebrae one, two, three, four, five, and if you mark out the pedicles of one and two, you will find that L1, uh, the lower, lower touched vertebra, the least touched vertebra is L1, where you can see that the CSV is just touching the vertebral body, is, just, is bypassing the pedicle, but L1 is the least touched vertebra. And the LSTV or the least substantially touched vertebra is L2. That means it is the CSV is touching the pedicle at some point in time or going medial to the pedicle. And this fits in with the stable vertebra, which is again L2 because the CSV most closely bisects the pedicles of L2. So the you end would vertebra, take a bite at some of the faculty, Samu, yeah, and ask them how they would... Uh, yeah, I will, I will subsequently, I'll just okay, throw sure, a few pieces sure, sure. down the line. I will. So, and this is the end vertebra, which is D12 because the cob ends at end vertebra. And finally, we have the neutral vertebra, which is neutrally rotated at L1. So if you look at the, uh, the cephalod most lumbar vertebra in which the CSVL intersected the pedicle outline was medial to it, that is LSTV. And LTV is usually lower down. Let's see what we did. We went down to L1 and six years down the line, there's no distal addition. So here, the lowest vertebra was LIV is LTV, that is the least touched vertebra and not the least substantially touched vertebra, which is L2. And here, we were only lucky because it is a 1A L curve. That means that the L4 you see here is not going to the right, but again, it's going to the left. Again, as opposed to Bhavok's pictures, my pictures are all with the heart shadow to the left. That means I look at my scoli pictures from the back. And so this L4 is not tilted to the right. So I could stop there. But if it is tilted to the opposite side, I might have to go down to L2. And that's where the decision-making in choosing the LIV is important. Uh, this is one curve and number two is lengthy three and six. As I told you, these are S-shaped curves and both curves needs to be fixed. This is a type three in which the thoracic is more than the lumbar, but as you see that the lumbar is not bending enough, it is bending only down to 45. And obviously we need to fix both curves. Let's go down to L4. And this is a, a, a curve which is lengthy 6CN in which the lumbar curve is more and thoracic curve is less. But obviously the thoracic curve is not bending uh, quite a lot. That means it's bending only to 40 degrees. So we have to fuse both curves and get a balanced spine. And this is the clinical picture. Now at this point in time, let us take uh, lengthy five curves. The lengthy five curves has an additional component of choosing the LIV in which, as you can see in this picture, so this is a picture in which you see that the, uh, the L, L3 is the uh, end vertebra. And if you look at the bending films or the traction films, the you cannot really stop at L3 because L3 is way out of the CSVL and the opposite, that means the concave bending films is not coming down to such a point that the L3-4 disc space is highly flexible. So here we did posterior, we went down to L4. 
but I will stop here and ask any of the faculty to say in this patient, what is the difference in which, as you can see that in the concave films, this is parallel. So in this case, what would be the lower level of fusion? Anybody, Abhay? So any, um, Arjun, you want to take a bite at this? Basically, it's tempting to do end to end from the front. What do you think? In, you can do it either ways. You can do it. I, I'd prefer to do it from the back. I would do D10 to L3 here. So practically end to end from the back. Yeah. Right. End to end Great, from Arjun. Back. Great, Arjun. And that's uh, a slight difference was that we did it from the front and we could. I'm sorry. So when it's a lumbar curve, you want to save maximum levels. Uh, there's a big role for anterior surgery to save even that one extra level. Yes. yes. And here I could do an anterior surgery, stop at L3 and thus centralize the spine quite well. And this was one of my old surgeries in which you can see I use the USS and this is usually not available with the side opening bars. And here you can see that these sticks are like that. And once they are derotated, the sticks are taken out and the lumbar concavity, I mean the lumbar lordosis comes back and the spine gets derotated. A massive advantage of anterior surgery is saving levels. What are the disadvantages in your opinion, Dr. Basu? Yeah, so one is the uh, approach. The fellows as well as uh, the current generation spine surgeons are not really very, uh, very uh, tuned up with anterior surgery. And the second is, it is definitely opening up the chest cavity. It is leaving a chest tube. It is one day of ICU stay at least. So this adds to the morbidity of the surgery. Now, what about the sagittal profile? Do you think it does yeah, harm? I, I can't do it. So there is one uh, criticism that lumbar anterior surgery is uh, basically kyphosing and not lordosing. And we want to build up lordosis. So this is something which I really do not find a lot of importance to. As you can see in this particular patient, my slide share is still on. Where do you find that the loss of lordosis has happened in the lateral view? It has not. Especially in the USS, I did not find that there is a lot of lordosis. And whenever I went down to L3, I would put in a cage at L23 and see how it works out, especially at the lower levels. You think but the 6.5 mm rod has to, something to do with it? A rod that doesn't flatten off? Maybe, maybe, maybe. But again, uh, I do believe that there is, uh, there, it is a technical challenge. It's not many surgeons are well versed with it. But if you plan your surgery well, and at least I always had the side opening screws when I was doing anterior. It's usually not kyphos. I'll go on to selective fusion. At this point in time, I think it's a correct time to go on to selective fusion and ask a few examples. So we all know that selective fusion have their criteria. I would not go into the details. I'll just quote Lenke's paper. The Lenke classification has given us a beautiful template for adjusting to a, a selective fusion of the spine. What does that mean? Now, basically, selective thoracic fusion means when there are two curves, you, uh, the thoracic is much rigid and much more than the lumbar. You stop the th at the thoracic, and if the lumbar curve is much more and much rigid than the thoracic, you stop at the lumbar. Now, uh, this the various criteria has already been discussed. I would not go into that. We know that in selective right thoracic fusion criteria that the right shoulder must be high, and the uh, Apical vertebral translation and rotation should be higher and the thoracic truncal shape should be more. But something which is usually not pointed out in selective thoracic fusion, uh, selective lumbar fusions, is the fact that when you do a selective lumbar and leave the thoracic, you're going to leave behind the rib hump, which the parents and the patient herself needs to realize and accept that. I'll give you a typical example. So this is a selective thoracic, and as you can see, she did well. Uh, the other thing for selective thoracic fusion, which is something which I've learned, uh, I uh, initially used to get very worried that after immediate postoperatively, they have some sort of a lumbar curve which is going to progress, but usually they do not. And this patient is now six years down the line. She's absolutely well balanced. There's no progression of the lumbar curve. And for this young lady, which is 72 degree lumbar curve and about a 40 degree thoracic curve, I stopped one shot intentionally. And I had a very detailed discussion with the patient that this patient is going to balance, but you're going to have a thoracic hump. You see, she's very well balanced four years down the line, but you can still see that there is a right thoracic hump. The shoulders are level, the pelvis is level, the, the skin creases are all, uh, all sort of leveled out. The pelvis is level, the pieces are level, but there is a persistent right thoracic hump, which you should discuss well with the patients and the parents before doing this. Now I'll go on to choosing the UIV. 
This is a little bit more complex and less written about. And this is why I took the chance of writing a full chapter, a full article, uh, uh, which came as a review article in the current uh, Indian Spun Journal. And if you uh, take a typical example, I'll take the example of a male because shoulder has two aspects, anterior and posterior, as well as two parameters, the medial shoulder height and the lateral shoulder height. So look at this patient who from 11 years to 17 years, he progressed to up to 60, 70 degrees. And if you look at this patient, once we did the surgery, came down from 62 to 26. Now, what is our typical shoulder deformity and how your UIV is important? You see, this is the medial shoulder height and this is the lateral shoulder height. So both are elevated here. That is important. There are many patients whom the lateral shoulder height is equal, but the medial shoulder height is not. And that, as already has been discussed, is the trapezoidal hump. And there are a couple of Japanese publications which have tried to identify this based on the soft tissue CT scans. And that has come up very well for our realization to understand that postoperatively, we need to compare. So this is the postoperative x-ray, you can see the level shoulders are there, the lateral shoulders, the medial shoulders are also somewhat uh, uh, central, uh, somewhat uh, even, out, even out in the frontal projection, but in the, in the posterior projection, you can still find that this trapezoid hump is there, which itself for the patient doesn't mean much because he usually doesn't look at his back and concentrates on his front. So what is the choice of UIV? The linky criteria for inclusion of the proximal thoracic curve in the fusion is that uh, proximal thoracic curve is more than 30, rotation more than grade one, apical translation more than one mm. centimeter, preoperative left shoulder elevation, and a significant T1 tilt. Uh, the Trubbish recommendations are the simply, simplest form uh, of recommendations which you can uh, sort of memorize, and this will give you a very good understanding. You can't go wrong in most of the situations. I'd say 90% situation, if you follow this, that in type one, three, or six, the UIV selection depends on T2 for preoperative left shoulder up, T3 for level shoulders, T4 for preoperative right shoulder. So this is a very good formula. Other than a few exceptions, you can take this into a sort of a module in your practice. Whereas if it is linky type two or four, you always go to T2 because the left shoulder is usually always, always up. And that is one of the clinical guidelines of choosing, uh, of uh, ascertaining whether it is a linky two or four. But again, in linky one, three or six, if it is level shoulders, go to T3. If it is right shoulder up, stop at four. If it's left shoulder up, then definitely go to T2. This is a patient who had a left shoulder up. And so we went up to T2 here and she did well. Now, before going into the next couple of uh, patients, I would, uh, I would just go through this slide before I ask the faculty. The status of preoperative shoulder levels in a right thoracic linky one and elevated right shoulder generally gets balanced by stopping at T4, that is getting a major thoracic curve fraction only. In an elevated left shoulder, strong consideration should be given to extend fusion to T2 to control the proximal curve. Now, in case of preoperative level shoulders, careful evaluation of the proximal curve should be done Fusion of the major thoracic alone may result in hydrogenic postoperative left shoulder up and fusion should be done to T2 or T3. Now, I will come to these two examples and ask the faculty about what is their observation in these two uh, patients. So this is the first patient when I went up to T2. And as you can see, there's a 40 degree curve. And this is what the patient looked like preoperatively and postoperatively. And this is a patient whom I went up to T4. He had a uh, basically a sort of a neutral shoulder, that means the right and left shoulders were the same levels, huge curve, good correction I achieved, and this is the post-operative picture. I'd ask the uh, faculty to comment on the shoulder levels in these two pictures. In one, I've stopped at T4, and if you look at, I tried not to correct T4 too much. This uh, convex uh, T4 screw is a little higher than the convex screw, so I left T4 a little bit tilted, but still something else happened. And uh, can I have, uh, say, anybody to uh, describe yeah, why the uh, shoulder elevation on the left side, which is there? Yes. Once you have stopped Absolutely. up to T4. <laughs> Absolutely. So that is what was very important to observe, that even in spite of the fact, of course, this patient was not that much. Uh, again, uh, the shoulder elevation was about one centimeter up. But still, in this patient, in spite of leaving T4 tilted, I ended up in a left shoulder up. Whereas in this patient, I went up to T2 and you can see that it was level shoulders to start with, 
and this level shoulders to end with but dr basu do you think this is a fair take home message here because very often as the year goes another year down she will decompense or compensate at the bottom of your fixation and the shoulders will level up again so do you think it's a lesson you want to uh, give away to the audience so again uh, that that's a very important consideration if you look at this patient we stopped at about l3 okay so there are three disc spaces down the line now if this patient has a good flexibility of this proximal thoracic curve and she is uh, at present right shoulder uh, left shoulder up and if this disc space is compensate and give this shoulder a little bit of leeway it might balance but in my experience i found that these three disc spaces might not be always going according to your wishes especially if you go down to l4 there are only two disc spaces to compensate for this they do not in l3 in 50% they would in 50% they would not but again the very nice point uh, pointed out abhay and so uh, post traumatic shoulder imbalance is an important i'll wrap up abhay because otherwise rajesh would not be able to speak yeah doc, the chair has given us a few more minutes so but i think it's good a good time to wrap up yeah sure so psi that is post traumatic shoulder imbalance is an important cosmetic issue and should be avoided the pre operative clinical and radiological assessment is crucial for planning out the uiv and uiv of t2 is mandatory for pre operative left shoulder at a higher level for those where the uiv of t4 is chosen you shouldn't try to ag uh, aggressively horizontalize t4 or uh, do a final compression in the convexity so that you bring down to t4 uh, the convex t4 screw down to the level of the left side that would put your left shoulder up and this should be avoided and under correction of the major thoracic curve often avoids a post traumatic shoulder imbalance thanks abhay for giving me this opportunity lovely so much to learn there and uh, any uh, burning questions i mean the clear question is that do you really believe that the spine dictates the shoulder i mean that's a philosophical question uh, dr basu uh, i think god dictates everything abhay but at the end of the day uh, based on your available uh, clinical and radiological guidelines and based on the available scientific evidence you need to take a call based on your own personal experience and based on your thought process that if it was your own child what would you have done would you do a full length surgery from t2 to pelvis or would you just stop short and see how god dictates the future would be your take so i would uh, in in my case for every patient i would uh, i would sort of understand weigh out the options of what the scientific literature tells me and what my sixth sense tells me yes uh, dr basu one question uh, uh, abhay yes dr amit yeah uh, in spite of uh, pre operatively planning and per operatively executing uh, still the patients do come with the shoulder imbalance so what uh, are the per operative criteria that uh, dr basu is using because even if you use that t1 tilt or anything because of the position and the shoulders sometimes that t1 also tilts because of the position in the prone position so what are the criteria per operatively to match the shoulder intra uh, so, criteria of judging whether you got your shoulders correct wow that's tough uh, so amit uh, the summary statement is put across first as abhay knows is that i do not rely a lot on my per operative guidelines i always do a planning pre operatively and all my fellows knows that i have a sheet which is uh, hanging on to the uh, drip stand when i am doing the surgery in which all the pedicle screws are marked out and there is no change of plans usually per operative guidelines are only Uh, sort of uh, something which rejuvenates my preoperative planning and the two preoperative guidelines are the upper for the upper instrumented level which is t4 or t2 whether the pedicle screws on both sides are horizontal or intentionally not horizontal and that's how i would uh, restrict my compression distraction uh, uh, proximally and for the lower one i would not only check for the horizontality of the pedicle screw but i will also check on the tangential views whether they are enough derotated or not so lumbar spine derotation is of critical importance to uh, prevent add on to prevent uh, djk and prevent uh, failure of the surgery these are the only two per operative guidelines everything else is pre operative guidelines thank you couple of audience questions from dr gautam and then dr bhau yeah dr sonawde asks you ke what is more important is spinal balance more important or derotation of the curve apex more important he asks you subsequently the second part of the question that he asked is 
get, which in brings to the point that if you are going to do an apical derotation maneuver by putting in pedicle screws, but that uh, putting in pedicle screws at the apex is dangerous in terms of neurological injury as well as pull out of the screws. Wouldn't you rather accept a slightly lesser rotational correction and do a costoplasty rather than endanger neuro and cause neurologic deficit? So the first question's answer is uh, uh, given my first slide. That is, it is more important to balance the spine and have level shoulders and level pelvis rather than uh, having the spine ramrod straight. So th th there is no other statements to that question. The answer to the second question is that. You know, before Lenke pointed out to the world that freehand thoracic spine screws are safe, he actually put across the CT scans as well as the clinical outcome of 264 thoracic pedicle screws. And he could prove that the chance of not putting into the pedicle, if it is not very deformed, I mean, anything beyond 80 degree curve is at the apex is something which is too risky and too difficult and you might have so these plastic pedicles, you might not be able to put in the screw. But anything below that, pedicle screws in the concavity at the apex region is quite safe, especially if you have uh, uh, radiological help. Now, the second is, it is not about derotating the apex always. If you can leave the apex uh, not, I mean, if you can leave the apex rotated, but at the end of the day, it's very difficult to not to rotate the apex and rotate the other areas. So if the entire curve gets derotated, the apex will always derotate. So you cannot have a selective derotation of the other uh, vertebrae other than the apex. If the other vertebrae does derotate, then it will take along with it a part of the apical vertebrae also. So you don't have to take a measure in uh, derotating the apex as such uh, in a different fashion. Uh, Dr. Bhauk, your question? Yeah, um, sir, I just want to ask, uh, we, are, we have been classically taught that we should not stop at the uh, middle of the apex, middle of a curve, uh, you know. So does it apply only to the coronal parameters or does it apply to the sagittal as well? Because suppose I'm uh, planning to stop at L3, then I look at the sagittal that the apex of the lumbar lordosis is at L3 in that particular patient. So should I stop at L3 or should I go to L4? So uh, you are talking of a, a lengthy, five, a lengthy three curve sort of, Yes sir. Three, yes, sir. In a lengthy three, you stop at L3. If you do not, if you do not land up in the apex, that means if the lumbar curve apex is at L3, either go down to four or stop at L2. Either risk uh, uh, adding on or you do extra surgery by going up to L4. So leaving behind two discs versus three discs in the lumbar spine, I don't think much of a difference. But I'm talking about sagittal plane. If I look at the sagittal X-ray, I'm, I'm coming to that. Yes, so the next, this is from the coronal aspect. The coronal yeah. aspect, if you are confused about L2 or L4, I would straight away say that go to L4. Nothing will happen in the long run. But in the sagittal plane, if you have to consider L2 versus L4, you remember firstly that you cannot end it beyond the, uh, at a kyphotic disc. L2, 3 disc is kyphotic. Definitely go down to three or four. But the concept of uh, Kim in the sa sagittal stable vertebrae, actually SSV came out for Schwarman's disease. It was originally a lengthy concept and Kim tried to put it across in AIS and he could have some evidence to prove that you also consider SSV in question and the lordotic disc space both together to cho choose your LIV. So in that case, if the L23 disc is kyphotic, definitely go down to L4. Thank you, sir. Right. Great, great, great discussion. Any other burning questions or can we jump across to the next speaker? Because there's so much to discuss on this, but I think Somajit has very nicely <laughs> wrapped everything up in a very short uh, presentation and I think that made a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Somajit, for lending Thanks. your vast experience Thanks, sir. Thanks. The seminar and you. All yours, Rajesh. Our final speaker actually deals with uh, the real thing. That's the surgical tips and tricks and the maneuvers when you're out there in the battlefield you know, facing up with the scoliotic deformity and trying to correct it as a surgeon. And again, this surgeon needs no introduction. He's done a vast amount of scoliosis work initially um, in the Sancheti Institute in Pune and now on his own merit, he's a scoliosis surgeon, uh, the first scoliosis surgeon in Pune city and one of the first ones uh, who brought this uh, specialty to our country. So, Dr. Rajesh Paras is from Pune. May you take over. Many thanks, Abhay, for the kind words and uh, all the stalwarts were on the panel. After the beautiful presentation by the master, Dr. Basu, let us see a few points. Just to make a comment to start with, 
please remember that all the classification systems of scoliosis have paralleled the advent and the innovation of the instrumentation, implantation, and the correction maneuvers. Every scoliosis surgery has to be immaculately planned. There is nothing left to chance, and you don't uh, plan as if I will see on table which pedicle screws or what one has to do. The induction is always usually done on a trolley, and after putting the catheter, the central lines and the IV lines, the neuromonitoring has to be checked before making the patient prone. Usually a modular OT table is a must like a Jackson table with a Wilson or Riley kind of frame. It could be an innovative local frame also, but please make sure it always allows the essential prerequisites. The preoperative imaging with fluoroscopy has to be done before you take an incision and provision has to be made if you want to plan for a wake up test. Protect all the osseous prominences, especially the jaws, those shoulders, also the iliac crest, as well as the knee joints. Abdomen has to be free to minimize the operative bleeding. Maintaining the anatomical lordosis is extremely important for your fixation, for your release, as well as the eventual result. The head has to have proper waist. If your fusion is extending close to the cervical thoracic junction, it is necessary not to tilt the head, but to keep it neutral. The shoulders and elbows should be at 80, 90 degrees to the trunk and also near the elbow joints. Eyes have to be taken special care of to avoid any kind of complications with the retina. Very rarely, you may require this kind of traction apparatus. I hardly use it, but if that is so, you need to modify the system. After giving the position, make sure that the neural monitoring is working well. Always mark the incision, looking at the proximal and distal part of the spine, which is straight. Don't hesitate to put a long steel rod at the initial marking position. It may be a straight line or minimal invasive, whatever you want to do. After taking the incision and inciting the stains of tennis tissue, land on the spinous processes directly. And from there, you start dissecting the tissue. Wide exposure and dissection is a must, taking care not to injure the soft tissues above and below the fixation levels and do not go close to the facet joints above and below the fixation levels. The release is either soft tissue or bony and both. The soft tissue is basically a superior shell release and dissection of the paraspinal muscles right till the tip of the transverse processes, right from T1 lower to the lower level of your fixation. The excision of the supra and interspinous ligaments along with the inferior part of the spinous process adds to this release by making the vertebrae a little more mobile. Excision of the inferior facets at every thoracic and lumbar level, which is involved in the fixation, is necessary to impart mobility as well as to bring out a better bony fusion. Pontis osteotomy may be required sometimes to make it more mobile. If you can see in this video, it is in three parts. The first part is to excise the inferior facets of the superior vertebra. You have to mark it, osteotomize it, remove the inferior facet, use it for the bone graft subsequently. After removing it, decorticate the underlying superior part of the inferior, superior facet of inferior vertebra everywhere. This is the first part which is common in all surgeries even if you don't want to do pontis. Step two is in removal of the interspinous, supraspinous ligaments, also the inferior part of the spinous processes and making the ligament of lamb exposed. Then comes the third part wherein you actually excise the ligament of lavum, go laterally, and make it extremely mobile. Epidural bleeding is extremely common. Try to have a direct control over it, because at every level, if it keeps on bleeding, then eventually the blood loss is more. Sometimes, if you come across a very rigid, severe curve, you may require osteotomies, like the PCOs or asymmetric PCOs, or PVCRs, or the complete vertebral tennis as well. Anterior release and multiple anterior discectomies are nowadays usually not done, except for link if you want to, want to do anterior fixation to cell segments or in revision surgeries where sometimes it's necessary. I've just given a diagrammatic presentation of PVCR, very rarely used when the apex is all completely bony, it is fused, and you may need to excise more than one vertebral segment to make it mobile. So correction of ribbon deformity or thoracoplasty sometimes used to be considered by certain authors as a way of release. Please remember, the mobility imparted by this is very limited. It has more of a cosmetic importance for correction rather than any kind of correction maneuver. Critical screw fixation is the first important step for your fixation and eventual correction of the scoliosis. But it should be 
First of all, plan on your CT scan action images. We all know the classification from critical screws, and we all know that type this particle should not be chosen. As Dr. Basu pointed out, extreme rotation near the apex or theory petal area more than 80 degrees is also a relative. So the technique which is chosen for this has to be a freehand technique or best on navigation technique, wherein you make a large entry point, try to look at the cancel score of the pedicle, go subsequently stage-wise with a blunt probe, like a linkage probe or spatula technique, and make sure that you put markers and do not hesitate to use sequential CM or one interoperative imaging. After confirming the track and making sure all osseous walls are intact, then only put the screw. If you have proper neuromonitoring, there is also a nerve root monitoring or a stimulator. Make sure yeah, that you use this to make to avoid any kind of neurological complication. After confirmation on the CM or OM, adequate script positioning, then only you should go on to make your correction manuals. This is a short video to tell you. Some of the schools are already placed. Based on every vertebral level, the entry point is different, as you know. So clear, complete clear picturization of the anatomical landmarks, visualization is extremely necessary. From T1 downward to S1, these entry points may change. When you make the entry, then the next thing is to visualize and understand the rotation, sequentially putting markers, identification, further making a clear track, and then going forward. Optimum diameter and proper length of the pedicle screw is important. Here you can see that the uh, nerve root stimulator was used to make sure that there was no problem. Then you choose the rod of the proper length and contour it. So before placing it, let's understand what are the victim correction maneuvers. The forces used for correction are obviously the compression, distraction, derotation, translation, and the various combination of all this along with anterior fixation. The preoperative planning of what you want to do for a particular curve is important based on the severity, rigidity of the curve, based on the region of the curve, and what kind of pedicles are there for purchase. So once you have ensured stronghold of the pedicle screws, then you go forward. You may use monopoly reduction screws, uniaxial screws, based on the correction maneuver you have planned. And you may use either a titanium or a cobalt chrome alloy rods or a combination based on what you have in mind. Commonest which used to be used is a cantilever rod fixation in the past. Nowadays, we are using derotation maneuvers more which could be either on the concave side first or a convex side first, or there could be a area pipe or a complete DVR at every level. Vertebral column manipulation is a term introduced by Lenke when you use multiple vertebrae at the same time for DVR using a construct. The translation is also used classically in sublaminal wires, previously in hard shield or hydrolipid, but it can be used in combination with the screws also. At the end, all of us use segmental compression destruction to finalize the correction. And sometimes, in addition to this, different maneuvers can be used as well. The cantilever fixation is used using a pre-bent rod when you attach it either proximally or distally. And then you force down the rod using a cantilever force to achieve a semblance of the correction. And sequentially, each screw tulip is engaged into the rod and the nuts is twist. So bending the operative table or applying manual force during this maneuver also helps. The concave rod derotation, as I said, is one of the commonest things which most of us do still. And segmental instrumentation of CD rod is this most common and popular maneuver. So here the rod is already placed in all screws on the concavity. Wise grips or strong rod holders are applied. Opposite side force is gently applied. Mind you, all this is after doing the thorough release. Make sure that step by step you start derotating. Do not at one time apply a force. Along with the vice grips, you can also use the hexagonal drivers or hexagonal uh, screwdrivers where the end of the rods have a hexagonal end. The opposite side cable is then used and put. But the opposite side rod is usually a stabilizing rod. The most important maneuver here was the concave rod, derotation, and then in the end, sequentially compression destruction at every level. Sometimes you need to keep on contouring the rod till you have a desired level. Always make sure there is not too much of a struggle when you want to put in the rod. This is just one example. I will not engage in cases. So another way is the convex rod derotation. So this was one case in which the convexity was more amenable because the apoptosis was less. It is thought that when you actually apply thoracic derotation, sometimes it has a bearing on the sagittal profile. 
So there are certain criteria to decide when to use this. Convexity also is safer to put in pedicle screws. So some people feel that putting pedicle screws and using convex rod is relatively a safer technique as far as the neurological complications are concerned. So similar maneuvers are used on the convexity. You can use reduction devices, different outriggers, towers to engage the rod. Simultaneously, second rod is used and the whole construct then sequentially can be used to derotate and side by side fixed. This is another case. Now, periapical derotation became an important thing because when you use only one sided rod to derotate, the ribham deformity can become prominent. There was a question from the audience sometime back if somebody asked about the derotation of the apical vertical. See over here, you can do selectively periapical derotation. Derotation always happens all over the rod, as Dr. Basu mentioned. If you still want to do, you can put either monoaxial screws over here or an assembly or a type of instrumentation where you can convert polyaxial into uniaxial or monoaxial with these towers. Every vertebra, if it had two screws, you can engage together to make it a very strong lever arm. And wherever you want, sequentially, you can go on derotating. Now, see here, along with derotation, the distraction forces are also applied on the concavity and the compression on the convexity. So you actually have three-dimensional correction as well as engagement of the proper contour rod. Sometimes it's also thought that when you want to finalize for the sagittal contour, titanium rod has a plane, it gives away. So you may use the first rod as the titanium rod, but eventually may use a cobaltron alloy if you want to convert a hypokyphotic thoracic curve with the properly corrected kyphotic curve later on. So a DVR technique is also something similar. You can see a clinical photograph over here. This is the legacy system. The only difference here and the uh, periapical system is you may go sequentially or selectively wherever you want. Now see the advantage of such systems is when you put pedicle screws, it is exactly the same as you would do for any other spine surgery. Just with these towers and outriggers and horizontal rods, you convert it into a very rigid mechanism where you have an actual purchase, purchase on the vertebra. Many times you may also find that the rotation is very severe only near the apex or in the prim primarily major structural curve and the secondary curve you may not need or you may need opposite derotation also. Let's go forward. This is just the same thing which is being shown. Now, as Dr. Lenke has suggested, sometimes you may do to require DCM. Now, this is the MESA system of Q2M, very versatile system. Initially, a straight rod is used and it is replaced by a contour rod. So you have a dual rod system. This is also known as a two rod uh, reduction system sometimes. And you can see sequentially when both rods are placed, then you can use number of screws together as let's say five or six segments together to move in a certain direction. Obviously, the rotation is towards the convexity. So suppose there is a right-sided rotation in the right thoracic idiopathic row, you require a left-sided correction and opposite for the compensatory lumbar curve if it is lower down. This is typically for a double major curve. We'll go forward from here, right? So sometimes you have put a rod, you have done the fixation, but you're not satisfied. Then what do you do? Do you remove it completely? No. Then there is an excellent way of correcting it either in the corona or sagittal plane by in situ bending. Now, many times when we apply this, the risk is that all the force comes from the pedicle screw, it can be yanked off, it becomes loose and it's a disaster. So you can do it in a controlled way. Now, this instrumentation system are not with every company, but it can be devised and we are good in indigenization as we know. So in situ bending also gives you excellent correction majority of things. Just to summarize and conclude my talk, I'll just show you something which is a great thing for uh, you know people like me and Abhay who have come from a school of thought that even sublaminal wires can be used in this. Now the objection is sublaminal wires, these are stainless steel wires can cause interspinal problems, but sometimes translation itself is a very good correction maneuver. So you can use a rod on one side, do all the correction maneuvers with vertical screws, whatever I've shown so far. And on the other side, you can use these steps to translate. Many a times, if you want to save on the cost of the implant, this is a great thing. Or there could be various other improvised applications also. So here, the forces used are basically 
all other forces along with a major translational force posteriorly and this gives a very good sagittal profile so to conclude the preoperative planning in any deformity correction of scoliosis is the most essential thing to good outcome proper positioning proper neuromonitoring making sure that there are no complications because of the positioning of the patient and other things is extremely important Pedicle screw placements has to be per the plan. Do a CT scan to identify the pedicles. Mark beforehand before you do the surgery. Choose a screw of optimum diameter and length. Then only you can do all these corrective maneuvers. The soft tissue releases, if required, pontis or other bony osteotomies are absolutely important. Otherwise, all the load will come in implants, and implant failures are extremely common. Choose correction maneuvers based on the type of curve, rigidity of the curve, extent of the curve, region of the curve. and the instrumentation which is available for you and de rotation is one of the most important factor for correction as of the understanding of scoliosis <coughs> thank you so much for your patient listening lovely rajesh that was absolutely on the ball and uh, before other questions we can take a few questions here before the other questions come in rajesh which maneuver in what curve can you give us some tips yeah usually as a uh, doctor basu said most of the time we are talking about type 1 type 3 type 4 So whenever there is a major thoracic curve, which is usually we expect to be hypokyphotic in adolescents, if it is not extremely rigid, concave rod application, derotation followed by segmental compression and distraction is what most of us can blindly follow. If suppose in a particular curve which is hyperkyphotic, which is unusual in idiopathic, but sometimes you may have hyperkyphotic curve, then be very sure how you apply this correction maneuvers or. you can choose a convex rod first and then go forward but de rotation is extremely important in rigid curves where you are required multiple pontis osteotomy more than 70 or 75 degrees fantastic any other comments from the faculty or any inputs arjun so i uh, i'd like to ask you know when are you uh, deciding when to do the ponti osteotomy when are you deciding not to do it you know yeah. uh, first first and foremost is a clinical examination where you understand the flexibility second is obviously the bending i i i rely on ultra bending and traction films as again dr basu mentioned so if i am anticipating the curve is going to be rigid even after soft tissue release i will not hesitate to do pontis osteotomy one reason is inferior facetectomy is part and parcel of every scoliosis surgery it takes only 5 to 10 minutes you know to add convert a facetectomy to a pontis osteotomy it does not have much complication so if in doubt do a pontis osteotomy you can add 3 to 5 degrees correction at every level so if you do for 5 to 6 levels in addition to your soft tissue release you are getting a huge advantage right have i answered your question yes yes can i can i ask a question to rajesh please yes, yes. please Rajesh, uh, uh, give us a comment on per operative uh, skeletal traction uh, do you use it um, Are you in favor of it? Against it? So uh, to, be, to, be, to be honest, with Ruth, I have I have done that in three cases out of maybe five fifty, and I was really happy. One of one of the persons developed a problem at the suprapandal level where I applied the skeletal traction. Another one kept on complaining about pain at the other side. Retrospectively, when I realized I was subconsciously only trying to uh, go away from the proper intraoperative releases or vertebrectomies or everything, and today if somebody asked me probably the complication rate of all these things and the advantage are mismatched so i would rather focus on my intraoperative releases than just rely completely on skeletal traction and intraoperative can i have a comment from uh, any of the other panelists of basu or uh, abhay babu can you intraoperative anybody? traction uh, yeah skeletal traction intraoperative yeah dr basu i almost never use it but uh, there are a lot of guys i think dr hegde uses it a lot apaji is on the show if you want to quickly unmute and uh, tell us about it appa ji yeah uh, uh, abhay thanks for asking so we routinely use a skeletal traction like a, a gardner well traction uh, in the um, head and a, a skin traction for the foot uh, we don't put tibial uh, skeletal traction at all so uh, but we we presented also last last year in imast and uh, it's been uh, i think we are in the process of writing about it there is a issue of uh, the thoracic kyphosis not not able to achieve thoracic kyphosis correctly if you do intraoperative traction otherwise uh, we have been routinely using the curve is beyond 70 80 degrees but less than 
Awesome. One last comment from Dr. Bhavuk, and then we'll uh, move regarding on. This, regarding the skeletal traction, I've never used it for uh, AIS cases. But yes, in some neuromuscular stiff cases, if there is a significant pelvic obliquity, in those cases, uh, you can use it. See, I always feel if you really require giving a preoperative halopelvic or something for a substantial duration is more beneficial than just intraoperatively doing yes, this. Agree. Right? The literature also says the same thing. Dr. Basu? So, uh, I'm absolutely sold out on helogravity traction for severe rigid curves, but I've never used preoperative traction. Same, right. same, same. Important, important. So uh, we are coming right. We've come right to the end of this show, and we've had 300 plus uh, viewers throughout. Considering the strength of the ASSI, you know, we have we have a big, big hit from because of this uh, fantastic faculty. And I'm going to ask each member of the faculty to give one pearl of wisdom uh, from their side. Uh, but before that, I'm going to take this show a bit and give my, uh, you know, summation of what I learned from what you guys all said. And uh, I think the first thing uh, first is that with power comes great responsibility. So if you're doing scoliosis surgery, you better be aware of uh, what's going on there. And you cannot handle uh, this as a, you know, as something that's a child's play. It's a different league. It's big game hunting. Remember that scoliosis is indeed a rotational deformity. It's not just a scoliosis. It is a hypokyphosis. And to understand hypokyphosis, you have to run your hand down into the spinous processes and uh, not go by the clinical impression of a kyphosis, which is actually the rib hump. And if it, there is indeed a kyphosis, when you plug your thumb down the spinous processes, it's a red flag. And Dr. Rohit uh, very eloquently told us about this. Uh, when you ask for the history, make sure that you get a fair assessment of the idiopathicism or idiopathy of this curve, rather than it being syndromic or congenital or, or anything else. Uh, look at the growth potential, see how tall the parents are, how short the kid is. Uh, the child is close to the uh, two, uh, you know, two watershed times around five years, around 10 years when there's going to be a growth spurt. Decide whether you want to do surgery or observe. Err on the side of observation. It's a race between growth and the curve. So push it as far as you can until you can handle it. Remember that these are the risks for progression and these are written in stone. And if any of this is present in your patient, uh, you got to think of this as a red flag and observe this patient far more, uh, you know, contentiously than otherwise. Um, of course, uh, when you examine the patient as a postgraduate in orthopedics, we learned that these are the 10 basic things that you want to give your examiner when you look at the girl and, you know, present your uh, diagnosis. Cover up all these from neck tilt all the way to limb, at limb attitude and um, calf wasting and neurology. Uh, examine strategically as a surgeon rather than a student and uh, look at the hump and the balance make a mental plan of what the requirements are. And as Dr. Rohit again told us, make a special request to ask or make a point to ask the parents or the child uh, what, which part of the deformity actually worries them. And don't assume that the rib hump or the, rib or the hip flank is what really bothers them. Dr. Arjun gave us a great rundown about x-rays. AP x-ray whole spine and uh, standing and lateral x-ray in all patients. Don't do x-rays more than once a year unless absolutely needed. Be very, very frugal about x-rays. Uh, bending x-rays only if surgery is planned. The whole faculty said that. Traction x-rays, if it's a telescoping spine, which means that the main thoracic curve is hanging low, um, the bending x-ray does not really reproduce what it's supposed to, and hence a traction film will stretch it out. We rarely do fulcrum bending and push-prone x-rays. You can even do them under general anesthesia to get close to, uh, close to the real picture. Uh, the thumb rule for all scoliosis surgeons is MRI in all cases because very often there's a surprise waiting for you. And today, MRI is quite easily uh, available. Uh, after this, we heard about uh, how to classify scoliosis and how to look at strategic vertebrae, Dr. Amit Jhala and Dr. Bhavut Garg. So typically, look at all spines as three curves. And uh, when, you, when you get that x-ray, you see the characteristics of each of these three curves rather than just focusing on the main curve. And uh, keep the clinical picture in the mind. Don't get lost in the x-rays because the x-rays may uh, sway you away. Dr. Amit Jhala gave us a good descriptive of the stable zone, the end vertebrae, the apical vertebrae. And um, generally speaking, the levels of fusion, Dr. Basu gave a very good talk on this on uh, uh, upper level, either UEV plus one or Lenke's rule, but there's a controversy whether the upper level will indeed affect the shoulder balance. You make a good, uh, you know, good judgment after your reading and, um, you know, go by even neck tilt angles if you wish and go by uh, what you believe and back yourself and go by your own experience. As far as the LIV is concerned, 
the rules are quite straightforward. Like Dr. Basu's uh, Basu school of scoliosis says, there's a C curve and an S curve, and it simplifies this. Um, a C curve is um, where the lower curve is really not playing any, uh, you know, demon. And um, if it is not playing a demon, your issue is about squeezing the LIV. It's no longer an issue of a selective fusion. And you can squeeze the LIV based on uh, all these rules written here. And if it's an S curve, it's really about taking one curve or both curves. You can't be halfway because you'll create a Mohs sin. So uh, these are all the you know given dictates for a selective thoracic fusion. If you don't follow these dictates, you can have what's called an adding on or you can have what's called a decompensation. Today, they're both called as proximal add-on and a distal add-on. Um, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Parasnis told us about correct screw placement. Uh, you know, the, your uh, your uh, API, uh, your um, anchor should be really strong. That's the first step in good scoliosis surgery. After correct clinical assessment, clinical uh, planning, good releases, good uh, anchors, and then finally, uh, if you get, uh, you know, if you do your osteotomies correctly and do your corrective maneuvers as shown to us, in a in a hard convex uh, a convex predominant hard curve rigid curve do a convex cantilever maneuver while in a soft curve do a concave derotation maneuver do not miss out on doing DVRs in all cases and sometimes you can add an intra op rod bending also to give you a better sagittal profile especially at the lower end of your curve try to do intra op balancing to eventually give a balanced and fused functional spine rather than a straight spine and that's the that's the name of the game today. If I can give you a straighter spine with a lower core angle, but taking 20% more vertebrae, I'm a poorer surgeon than Dr. Basu who can give you a balanced spine, but more flexible spine, taking 20% lesser vertebrae. So may I, uh, in the order of um, uh, presentations, can you all give one take home messages to our audience so we can uh, go home happy and smiling on the thought that Mumbai Indians seems to be running away with the game today. Uh, Rohit, maybe for you yeah. first. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough act to follow uh, uh, Abhay Nene uh, once he's uh, summed up everything so beautifully. And that also after a great session by, by all my co-panelists. So awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Abhay. That last sum up was, uh, was a sixer right out of the park. Um, I guess the one message that uh, you've asked me to put out is, um, you know, have a very high index of suspicion for uh, underlying organic uh, curves. Don't assume that anything is an AI, I mean, is an idiopathic curve until you have absolutely ruled out everything. And I think the last thing that what Abhay said about MRI for all, that's critical uh, because often everything is okay. You even have a normal abdominal reflex, but if you end up with, uh, with something in the, in, the, in the spinal cord, then you're going to be in trouble. Okay. So hunt, hunt till you find it. And only when you don't find it, will you rest and call it an AIS. Thank you. Arjun? Yeah, all the talks were exceptional. And your summary was, uh, I think, a tough fact. What is to your take home message for us? restrict your x-rays and do an MRI for all. Lovely, lovely. Amit, unmute. Please unmute yourself. Execution and planning are very important, but unless you get a good x-rays, full films, you cannot plan, you cannot have a strategic vertebra plan and you cannot execute or plan anything. So I think the most important thing in scoliosis is to get a very good quality AP and lateral x-rays and bending x-rays. That's it. Fantastic. Bhauk? So, uh, one thing is, uh, like every uh, scoliosis surgeon, he should have a scoliometer with him. Because, you know, a 40 degree curve, it, it may not be looking progressing on the x-rays. But, you know, the 40 degree curve may be having different rotations when the patient follows up. So, it may be progressing. So, the scoliometer is a must and you should follow with x-rays as well as scoliometer. And the other thing is the documentation. Keep, keep documentation of every patient, you know, pre-op, all x-rays, post-op, start analyzing your cases. And, you know, start looking at where did you some, did some mistake or whether you could have improved. And start looking at your classifications. Lovely. Dr. Basu? I'll speak last after Rajesh. Okay. You get the uh, <laughs> priority. Dr. Basu, you're the most senior amongst us. Dr. You Basu. also hit the last sixer and be the hero as always. No, I want to clear a completely <laughs> different runs, thing. Yes. Everything yeah. is being finished. I don't want to uh, just read. I just want I mean, to Dr. Say Basu that. honestly represents the section of ASSI, the modern section of the ASSI. That has bought all this to us. So we will give you the right of way, sir. Rajesh? Every case choose as your special, unique case. Do not fall into the trap of just classifications and the jargon. And give equal importance to the restoration of sagittal profile, not just the coronal balance. Dr. Basu? So I wanted to speak last because I wanted to say something which uh, 
is beyond the discussion of today all the my message to all the young guys who are listening to us today is the fact that rely a lot on your anesthesia colleagues and your neural monitoring colleagues scoliosis surgery is everything has been discussed the uh, a's and b's and z's of scoliosis ais surgery but nothing has been said about anesthesia protocols because that's where the patient we lose patients we land up in serious complications I have a very good anesthesia icu and critical care team with you before embarking on this surgery and i have a very very dependable neuro monitoring guy that's mandatory thanks so much sum it up it also tells us that doctor i i would have talked to dr basu's wife is an anesthetist and dr chala's wife is a radiologist but it is otherwise indeed we are all married to our profession we are all uh, husbands of uh, spine surgery and on that note um, we've con- we are concluding a superb session on ais and it was great learning the comments so were wonderful thank you for staying with us thank you for pitching in with your heart and your soul uh, thank you assi thank you ortho ortho tv stay balanced thanks a lot Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.